Chapter 1. Pastor and Theologian A pastor, a scholar, a divine of the first magnitude, holiness gave a divine luster to his other accomplishments. It shined in his whole course and was diffused through his whole conversation. David Clarkson, Funeral Sermon for John Owen, September 4, 1683 The year of his birth, 1616, was the year of William Shakespeare's death. When he was only thirty-three years old, he preached before the English Parliament. It was not for the first time, but on this occasion King Charles I had been publicly executed less than twenty-four hours before. At the age of thirty-six, he was appointed to be Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford, in American terms the President, by the English General and future Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell. In 1662, along with around 2,000 other ministers, he was ejected from the Church of England for refusing to conform to the use of the Book of Common Prayer in church services. Thereafter, under the threat of arrest, he served as the pastor of nonconformist congregations. During the last period of his life, he pastored a congregation in London. He died in 1683, leaving behind him a legacy of writings that now occupy 24 large volumes averaging around 600 pages each. His name was John Owen. In his own time, he was England's greatest living theologian. Now, more than 300 years after his death, many still regard him as such. But who was he? Early Life John Owen was born in Stadham, now Stadhampton, about ten miles southeast of Oxford. His father, Henry, was the minister of the local congregation. He had an older brother, William, who also became a minister, and two younger brothers, Henry, who entered the military, and Philemon, who was killed while on military duty in Ireland in 1649, and a sister whose name is unknown. The Owens were a Puritan family. I was bred up from my infancy under the care of my father, Owen wrote, who was a nonconformist all his days, and a painful, hard-working laborer in the vineyard of the Lord. Scholars have long debated what constitutes a Puritan. The term describes a wide variety of individuals, ranging from Anglicans who simply wanted to see the Church of England purified from some of its unbiblical features, to individuals who, in their opposition to the Church of England, stood on the margins of Christian orthodoxy. Henry Owen, as his son John would later do, stood in the mainstream of biblical orthodoxy, and was perhaps concerned only to see biblical guidelines followed in the worship and governance of the church. In any event, he was a faithful gospel minister and father. As Calvin said of Timothy, so we could say of Owen, he sucked in godliness with his mother's milk. Having received his early education from his father, when he was around ten years old, thanks to a generous uncle, Both he and his elder brother William were sent to a small school in Oxford to prepare for entry to Queen's College in Oxford University. Students at Oxford in the 17th century were, by and large, either gentlemen or scholars, but rarely both. In many ways, the university served as a kind of educational finishing school for the upper classes, many of whom would neither take exams nor graduate. Owen, however, entered the university with a view to study, and he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts alongside his brother in 1632, at age 15 or 16. In essence, the bachelor's degree was merely preparatory to the master's degree studies that followed. He duly graduated with a Master of Arts in 1635. Owen's education was classical. Logic, philosophy, mathematics, ancient history, astronomy, Greek and Hebrew, Latin was the lingua franca of the academic world, from college sermons to lectures and debates. Against that background, it is perhaps not surprising that Owen had as much facility in Latin as in English, indeed, perhaps more, since much of his written English scarcely masks its deep Latin influences. Clearly, Owen benefited enormously from his studies. He had an outstandingly able academic tutor in Thomas Barlow, and he did not neglect the Latin maxim mensana in corpore sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. He ran, threw javelin, and enjoyed playing the flute. He later appointed his teacher, Thomas Wilson, to the chair of music in the university. Clearly, he was a serious student, and he disciplined himself to the extent that he often took only four hours of sleep. 
On graduation, Owen's intention was to engage in the prolonged studies required to attain the Bachelor of Divinity degree, then a seven-year program. But Oxford University had fallen under influences alien to Owen's Puritan background. William Laud had been appointed university chancellor in 1630 en route to becoming Archbishop of Canterbury some three years later. King Charles I had already forbidden debates on the Calvinistic themes of election and predestination, and Laud followed this through with a Catholicizing of the ethos of college life and the reintroduction of high liturgy in chapel worship, all mingled with Arminian theology. The signs did not look auspicious for a Puritan student in divinity, and after a further two years of study, Owen left to become family chaplain and tutor in the home of Sir Robert Dormer in Ascot, shortly thereafter accepting a similar position in the house of Lord Lovelace at Hurley. Here, presumably, his duties were not onerous, and he had leisure to continue his studies. Lord Lovelace, however, was a supporter of the king in the building conflict with Parliament, and in 1642 Owen moved on to take up residence in London. New Beginnings the year Owen arrived in London, the English Civil War broke out. Now in the capital, Owen was able to follow the crucial events of the day firsthand. More important, however, was a more personal experience that was to change his life permanently. By all accounts, Owen developed into a warm and genial individual, but he rarely gives himself away in his writings. If he kept journals, as many Puritans did, they were presumably destroyed at the time of his death. But what seems clear at this stage in his life, he was then in his mid-twenties, is that while he was committed to Puritan principles, he had no settled assurance that he belonged to Christ. On occasion, in his published works, he gives scarcely veiled hints that he experienced deep spiritual distress. One Sunday in 1642, he went with his cousin to hear the celebrated Presbyterian minister, Edmund Calamy, preach at St. Mary's, Aldermanbury. But Calamy was unable to preach, and his substitute was a little-known minister. Despite his cousin's prompting, Owen had no heart to go elsewhere. As a result, he heard a sermon on Christ's words to the disciples after the calming of the storm. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Matthew 8.26 He was immediately brought into a new sense of peace and assurance. The imagery of the text, as we shall see, would later echo throughout his writings. Later that same year, he began his career as an author with the publication of a polemical work, A Display of Arminianism. The book was dedicated to the Committee of Religion, which had begun its work as a kind of theological watchdog two years earlier. In turn, the committee appointed him the following year to serve the church at Fordham in Essex. Now settled in pastoral ministry, Owen met and married Mary Rook, who would bear him eleven children, only one of whom survived into adulthood. By 1646, however, his ministry at Fordham came to an end. His original appointment had been the result of the sequestration of the previous incumbent. Now the appointment of his successor reverted to the original and non-Puritan patron. But John Owen had already come to public attention. He had recently been invited to preach before Parliament. Now he was appointed to serve the congregation of St. Peter's Cogshall, also in the county of Essex. This was a large congregation that had recently enjoyed the distinguished ministry of Obadiah Sedgwick. Here, Owen both ministered within the parish church and also gathered a fellowship along congregationalist lines. His thinking had now developed from the more Presbyterian perspective he had earlier adopted when he had written The Duty of Pastors and People Distinguished for his Fordham congregation. Owen employed a wise and good principle whenever he thought through any controversial issue. He studied the strongest and best exposition of the view he opposed. In the case of church government, he had read the Congregationalist John Cotton's book, The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, and found it convinced him. His precise views in later life have been debated, but the indications are that he held to something like a loose form of Presbyterian Congregationalism that both recognized that a congregation is the church in any particular place, yet, as such, wisely consults with other congregations in matters of common interest or concern. Stepping onto the National Stage As events in the Civil War began to move inexorably to their climax, Owen found himself further caught up into national life. At the same time, his career began to intersect with that of Oliver Cromwell, the charismatic general who would later rule as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. 
In the summer of 1648, the nearby city of Colchester was under siege by General Thomas Fairfax and the Parliamentarian's new model army. Owen was invited to preach to the troops and became a personal friend of some of the officers, including Henry Ireton, Cromwell's son-in-law. Step by step, Owen was becoming a public figure. The next year, as we have seen, he preached before Parliament the day after Charles I's execution. Rather than engaging in triumphalism, Owen instead preached on the call to humility and steadfastness in the face of suffering. Three months after that momentous occasion, he was invited to preach before Parliament once again, with Cromwell in the congregation. The following day, Owen visited the home of General Fairfax. While Owen waited to be seen, Cromwell and a number of his officers arrived. Recognizing Owen, Cromwell put his hand on his shoulder and said, Sir, you are the man I must be acquainted with. Owen's quick-thinking response was to say, That will be much more to my advantage than to yours. We shall soon see that, Cromwell replied. He immediately invited Owen to join him in Ireland and to serve both as his chaplain and as a visitor to Trinity College, Dublin. Owen's younger brother Philemon already served in the army and persuaded him to accept the challenge. Thus Owen accompanied some 12,000 psalm-singing soldiers in the new model army. Cromwell lay siege to the city of Drogheda, Ireland, which had become the focal point of resistance for royalist opposition. When it refused to accept terms of surrender, Cromwell's army showed no quarter in taking the city. Students of history have discussed and debated both the number of civilian casualties and the ethics of Cromwell's action ever since. Owen was almost certainly not an eyewitness of the event, but his intimate knowledge of it stirred him to both high eloquence and passionate appeal when he preached before Parliament on his return. How is it that Jesus Christ is in Ireland only as a lion staining all his garments with the blood of his enemies, and none to hold him out as a lamb sprinkled with his own blood to his friends? He pleaded with the members of Parliament that the Irish might enjoy Ireland so long as the moon endureth, so that Jesus Christ might possess the Irish. I would that there were for the present one gospel preacher for every walled town in the English possession in Ireland. The land mourneth, and the people perish for want of knowledge. The tears and cries of the inhabitants of Dublin after the manifestations of Christ are ever in my view. Later in 1649, Owen became an official preacher at the Palace of Whitehall, and the following year he was with Cromwell again, this time on an expedition north of the border to subdue the Scots. Here Owen preached and debated repeatedly, on one occasion, according to local tradition, finding himself at least matched, if not bettered in discussion, by the brilliant young theologian and minister Hugh Binning. Cromwell was sufficiently impressed to ask for his name, and discovered it was Binning, which may have been pronounced more like Bunning. He commented with a sharp pun, He hath bound well indeed, and then, putting hand to sword, added, But this will loose all again. Oxford and Cromwell again In 1651, Owen became dean of Christ Church, Oxford, and in September the following year, contrary to Owen's personal wishes, Cromwell appointed him the university's vice-chancellor, the executive head of the university. He preached regularly in his college and also on alternate Sundays with his friend Thomas Goodwin at St. Mary's Church. When not preaching at St. Mary's, he seems to have preached to familiar friends at Statham. It is to a sermon series from this period that we owe one of the books for which Owen is best known today, On the Mortification of Sin. On reading this paperback-length book for the first time, most contemporary Christians are left feeling they have never read anything quite like it. That impression is deepened by the realization that Owen's profound spiritual analysis is simply the edited version of messages he had preached to a congregation composed, in large measure, of teenage students. Perhaps memories of his own earlier spiritual struggles underlined for him how important it is to go deep as early as possible. There are few things more important in the Christian life than learning to overcome sin. We all have in our mind's eye a picture of a Puritan. It is often a distorted one. Owen apparently did not resemble the dark misrepresentation. Indeed, the contemporary caricature of him, however overdrawn it may have been by his enemies, actually demeaned him by drawing him in bright colors. According to Anthony Wood's famous description, he, instead of being a grave example to the university, scorned all formality, 
undervalued his office by going in corpo like a young scholar, with powdered hair, snake-bone band strings, lawn bands, a very large set of ribbons pointed at his knees, and Spanish leather boots with large lawn tops, and his hat mostly cocked. Yet even Wood was forced to acknowledge, doubtless with a touch of cynicism, his personage was proper and comely, and he had a very graceful behavior in the pulpit, an eloquent elocution, a winning and insinuating deportment, and could, by the persuasion of his oratory, move and win the affection of his admiring auditory almost as he pleased. Oxford was in a state of disarray at the end of the Civil War. Five of the colleges were deserted. Some had been used largely to quarter military personnel. Owen referred to the despised tears and sobs of our almost dying mother, the university. But his administration brought fresh life into the institution, new and distinguished faculty members, and a period in which a variety of influential students would pass through its corridors of learning. His major regret from his decade in academia seems to have been that his literary output was not greater. Yet it was during this time that he published several of his most substantial works, including The Doctrine of the Saint's Perseverance, 1654, in essence a book review of John Goodwin's Arminian treatise Redemption Redeemed, but one that extends to some 666 pages in the Gould edition of his works. In a steady stream of literary output, there followed his defense of Orthodox Christianity against Socinianism in Vindicie Evangelicae, which he dedicated to Cromwell, 1655, of the mortification of sin in believers, 1656, of communion with God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 1657, of schism, 1657, and of temptation, the nature and power of it, 1658. He must also have been working on his extensive Latin work, Teologumena Pantodapa, Theology of All Kinds, 1661. The reasons for viewing himself as a literary underachiever were not sloth or indifference. As he himself hinted, much of his time was taken up with affairs of state. Not only was he called on to preach before Parliament and on other civic occasions, but he also served as one of the triers charged with assessing fitness for gospel ministry, and was frequently consulted by both politicians and pastors, and by Cromwell in particular on matters of national and ecclesiastical importance. He served in a variety of ways as a negotiator and troubleshooter. Owen Starr as vice-chancellor would, however, soon be on the wane. The parliament that had held out so much hope to him of a nation led by genuinely Christian and Reformed leaders had, to his mind, grown spiritually tepid. In particular, Owen was deeply troubled by and opposed to the proposals being aired in 1657 that Cromwell should become king. Cromwell was offered the throne on March 31st and wrestled with the decision for a number of weeks thereafter. In early May, he seemed to be on the verge of accepting it when his son-in-law, Charles Fleetwood, Thomas Pride, who had signed the death warrant for Charles I, and others approached him personally with their objections. They called Owen into service in order to draw up a petition opposing his enthronement, and Cromwell immediately declined the throne. This marked the end of any royal aspirations Cromwell may have had. It also marked the end of Owen's ease of access to him and influence on him. More than a decade later, Owen was personally attacked by the Anglican minister George Vernon in A Letter to a Friend Concerning Some of Dr. Owen's Principles and Practices, 1670. Accused of promising Cromwell during his last illness that he would be raised up, Owen replied, I saw him not in his sickness nor in some long time before. Although not involved in the installation of Cromwell as Lord Protector, he does seem to have had some part in Cromwell's funeral services. Thus, Owen's leadership of the university as a whole came to an end in 1657, although he remained as dean of Christ Church until the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. Despite his differences with the Lord Protector, Owen's speech on the occasion of the election of Cromwell's son Richard to the office of Chancellor of Oxford abounds in graciousness. There is no need to expatiate now on his, Oliver Cromwell's, merits or to recount his benefactions when all are eager to acknowledge their debt to him for all their blessings. Therefore, it is deliberately that I refrain here from giving any formal appraisal of the wisest and most gallant of all the men whom this age, rich in heroes, has produced. In whatever direction England finally moves, it will go down to the ages that she had a ruler who had the glory of this island and the respect for religion close to his heart. George Vernon also accused Owen of 
being the instrument in the ruining of his, Oliver Cromwell's, son, and in the failure of the protectorate in which he followed his father. Owen was certainly close to a group of men who shared a common desire for a republic rather than a protectorate, corporately described as the Wallingford House Group, because of their meeting place, but he denied the charge. With whose, Richard Cromwell's, setting up and pulling down I had no more to do than himself. In October 1658, during his closing years at Oxford, Owen participated in a gathering of representatives of around 100 independent churches meeting at the Savoy Palace in London. Here, as an expression of doctrinal unity, and to a degree as a defense against the often expressed criticism that independency, in advocating local congregational control and rejecting church hierarchies, was a form of sectarianism that wounded the Church of Christ, the independents drew up a declaration of faith with a lengthy preface probably largely written by Owen. In great measure, the Savoy Declaration of Faith and Order adopts the text of the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1647. Its most substantial changes were in its discussion of repentance, chapter 15, the addition of an entirely new chapter 20, of the gospel and of the extent of the grace thereof, a rewriting of an entire section on the limits of the authority of the magistrate with respect to the church, chapter 24, section 3, and a new writing of sections 2 and 5 in the chapter on the church, chapter 26. Perhaps the most interesting change in relation to our theme is the way in which chapter 2 of God and of the Holy Trinity was revised to conclude with these additional words, expressing, as we shall see, a deep Owenian conviction. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon Him? The Restoration and the Ejection After the execution of Charles I, Parliament abolished the monarchy and declared England to be a commonwealth. But after Richard Cromwell failed to continue his father's success as Lord Protector, Parliament removed him and restored the monarchy in 1660. King Charles II, son of the king whom Parliament had executed, was crowned on April 23, 1661, at Westminster Abbey. The Restoration ushered in difficult times for Owen and his fellow nonconformists. A new religious settlement was now put in place and undergirded by the Acts of the Clarendon Code, which placed heavy restrictions on nonconformists. The Corporation Act of 1661 prohibited nonconformists from holding civic office. The Act of Uniformity of 1662 excluded them from office in the Church. This Act led to the expulsion of some 2,000 ministers from the Church of England, an event known as the Great Ejection. The Conventicle Article of 1662 made nonconformist meetings illegal. The Five Mile Acts of 1665 prohibited nonconformist ministers from living within five miles of any place where they had once ministered. Owen declined to conform, and thus, his service to the University of Oxford was brought to an end. He withdrew to his small estate at Stadhampton and sought to continue to minister to gathered groups of believers there and elsewhere in contravention of the law. He did not lack opportunities to conform, he may well have been offered a bishopric, or to serve elsewhere, he was invited to follow John Cotton at the First Congregational Church of Boston, Massachusetts. He remained with others who suffered for the sake of their conviction. While not exposed to the same privations as some of his brethren, Owen and his family do seem to have moved from one house to another where they would be protected guests. For a man who had moved easily in the corridors of power, these must have been days of profound humiliation. In 1665, England experienced the most severe outbreak of plague since the Black Death struck Europe in the 14th century. In London, about 15% of the population died, including more than 7,000 in one fateful week. The plague finally ended in 1666, which was also the year of the Great Fire of London. These events were thought by many to be a divine judgment for the treatment of the nonconformists. In any event, Owen joined many of his Puritan brethren in ministering to the needy in the city. He took this opportunity to plead for toleration in his works, Indulgence and Toleration Considered, and A Peace Offering, both published in 1667. He continued to work behind the scenes to secure relief for his fellow independents. Indeed, on one occasion, he was forced to defend his actions for receiving a considerable sum of money from the Duke of York, a Roman Catholic, to alleviate the privation of suffering dissenters. Although arrested or close to arrest on a number of occasions, he was never imprisoned. Owen knew and greatly esteemed the suffering 
tinker preacher John Bunyan, and indeed appears to have been the go-between to make arrangements for his own publisher, Nathaniel Ponder, to publish Bunyan's great work, The Pilgrim's Progress. According to both Bunyan's and Owen's biographers, the king once asked Owen why he so appreciated an uneducated tinker like Bunyan, to which he replied, Could I possess the tinker's abilities for preaching, please, your majesty, I would gladly relinquish all my learning. Faithful to the End In 1673, the little congregation to which Owen privately ministered united with the church fellowship of which the Westminster divine Joseph Carl had been pastor. During this last decade of Owen's life, his time would be spent writing, preaching, and giving counsel. His first wife Mary died in 1675. He was married again 18 months later to Michelle, the widow of one Thomas Doyley. Her companionship must have filled a great void in his life and at the same time brought much comfort in days of ongoing sickness. Throughout these years, Owen suffered from severe asthma and gallstones and at times was too sick to preach. He nevertheless continued to publish almost two dozen items issued from his pen during this last decade. Even in his dying months, he was working on what by any reckoning is a classic work of theology, filled with spiritual sensitivity and personal devotion, meditations and discourses on the glory of Christ. No account of his life, however brief, would be complete without including a section of the letter he wrote to his friend Charles Fleetwood on the day before his death, and a conversation he had with a colleague on the next morning. To Fleetwood he wrote, I am going to him whom my soul hath loved, or rather, who hath loved me with an everlasting love, which is the whole ground of all my consolation. The passage is very irksome and wearisome through strong pains of various sorts, which are all issued in an intermitting fever. All things were provided to carry me to London today, attending to the advice of my physician, but we were all disappointed by my utter disability to undertake the journey. I am leaving the ship of the church in a storm, but whilst the great pilot is in it, the loss of a poor under-rower will be inconsiderable. Live and pray and hope and do not despair. The promise stands invincible that he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. How fitting that in almost his last recorded words there should be a final appearance of imagery from the text that had brought him into the assurance of Christ he had now long enjoyed. The next day he confirmed his sense of assurance with even greater force when William Payne, a minister from Saffron Walden, visited to tell him that his meditations on the glory of Christ was at that very hour going to press. The dying Owen's response was memorable. I am glad to hear it, but, O oh, Brother Payne, the long-wished-for day is come at last, in which I shall see that glory in another manner than I have ever done, or was capable of doing, in this world. By the evening of that day, August 24, 1683, St. Bartholomew's Day, Twenty-one years after the ejection of two thousand ministers from the Church of England in 1662, and on the anniversary of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, when between five thousand and thirty thousand French Protestants were slaughtered, John Owen was with Christ. On the 4th of September, followed by a long line of stately carriages, his body was taken to Bunhill Fields, the nonconformist burial ground then just outside the city of London. There were the mortal remains of friends and fellow laborers in Christ, John Bunyan, David Clarkson, once his assistant, his friend Charles Fleetwood, and many others, the dust of John Owen, pastor of Christ's flock, preacher of Christ's gospel, teacher of Christ's universal church, awaits the glory of the resurrection. There can be no doubt, for all his massive intellect and prodigious self-discipline, how does one man write twenty-four volumes using seventeenth-century writing materials, that the secret of Owen's life lay not in his natural gifts, but in his deep devotion to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Perhaps the summary of his life that most matched his own aspirations is found in these words from a defense of Owen's character and work, vindication of Owen by a friendly scrutiny. His general frame was serious, cheerful, and discursive, his expressions savoring nothing of discontent, much of heaven and love to Christ and saints and all men, which came from him so seriously and spontaneously, as if grace and nature were in him reconciled, and but one thing. To this day the words of Thomas Gilbert's epitaph can be found on his gravestone, Et misis ceteris, coluit ipse sentique, beatum quam scripsit cum deo communionem.
and with a disregard for other things, he cherished and experienced that blessed communion with God about which he wrote. To the wonder of this privilege, and to Owen's unique exposition of it, we now turn. Chapter 2 In the Name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit Owen's teaching on communion with the Trinity drives one to seek the face of God in three persons and to enjoy the rich fare of his banqueting house. For those seeking assurance of their salvation, it is a particularly valuable cordial. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones Why write about communion with the Trinity? Can such a theme have any practical value for living the Christian life today? How easily we lose sight of what is basic to the New Testament and its teaching on what it means to be a Christian. For the whole Christian life, from the outset, is lived in the light of the fact that we have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. To be a Christian is, first and foremost, to belong to the triune God and to be named for Him. This is the heart and core of the privileges of the gospel. Once we were aliens from the family of God, strangers to Christ, without desire or power to please Him. But now, through the Son whom the Father sent into the world to save us, and the Spirit who brings all the resources of Christ to us, we have come to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13.14 to become a Christian believer is to be brought into a reality far grander than anything we could ever have imagined. It means communion with the triune God. Yet is it not true that, despite some signs of encouragement, many Christians rarely give much thought to the importance of God's being Trinity? Sometimes it seems that a one-person God is enough to satisfy us, whether that one person is Father or Son or Holy Spirit. Thinking of God as triune simply complicates matters, or so it would seem, since the doctrine of the Trinity is surely, one, the most speculative, and two, the least practical of all Christian doctrines, is it not? Speculative, for how can God be three in one, and impractical, since it makes no real difference to day-to-day -day Christian living. A Neglected Truth Many Christians are surprised to learn the kind of company in which we find ourselves when we think in this way. For this was the view of the philosophers of the Enlightenment. Indeed, it is precisely the view of Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, who famously wrote, The doctrine of the Trinity, taken literally, has no practical relevance at all, even if we think we understand it, and it is even more clearly irrelevant if we realize that it transcends all our concepts. A century later, Friedrich Schleiermacher, 1768-1834, often called the father of modern theology, further affected the Christian church when he relegated his discussion of the Trinity to an appendix in his major work, The Christian Faith. But what was once the position of liberal Christianity has now reappeared and has been woven into the warp and woof of evangelicalism. We live in an age that stresses practical Christian living, we have little patience for the difficult doctrine of the Trinity. So, was Kant right after all? Does the doctrine of the Trinity have no practical relevance? John Owen faced similar reactions. On the one hand, attacks on the irrational nature of the doctrine of the Trinity, and on the other, emphasis on only one or another person, Father or Son or Holy Spirit. Yet Owen believed that rather than being speculative, the doctrine of the Trinity provided the light by which everything else became clear. Rather than being impractical, it was the most practical truth of all. For what can be more practical than knowing God in Jesus Christ and through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit? For this is surely the eternal life of which Jesus spoke. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17.3 in the light of this, it might seem puzzling that eternal life could be reduced to feeling peace, finding purpose, or alas, making advance in the project of the life of the self. By contrast, Jesus himself described it as knowing God. This knowledge of God is our boast, Paul noted, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 1.31. 
His words echo the great statement of Jeremiah, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Nor is this an old covenant rather than a new covenant perspective. For later, speaking again as the mouthpiece of God, Jeremiah foresees the days of the new covenant. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31, 34. The forgiveness of sins we enjoy, the peace with God we receive, Indeed, our justification and reconciliation are, in one sense, means to this great end, that we might know Him. This is why Paul can describe conversion in these terms. Now that you have come to know God, Galatians 4, 9. This is surely why the Lord Jesus, in the darkest hours of His disciples' lives, spent time teaching them the knowledge of God, and especially the interrelationships of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the significance of these relationships for believers. Owen shared his master's magnificent vision. We were made to know and love God in all his glory. To our shame we have turned our backs on such an honor. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans 1.21 the wonder of the gospel is that we can be restored to this high privilege as we learn what it means to have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Colossians 3.10 It is not surprising, therefore, that someone as steeped in biblical thinking as John Owen would place the knowledge of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the center of his teaching. Owen's Answers we would expect that John Owen would have his own answers to the two most common reasons for neglecting Trinitarian thinking and living. One, to suggest that the Trinity is an irrational doctrine is to be guilty of making man and his reason the measure of all things. It makes the common but false philosophical assumption that God is like a man, so that whenever we speak or think about him, we are simply attributing to him larger versions of what is true of ourselves. But, as Karl Barth once wittily remarked, one cannot speak of God simply by speaking of man in a loud voice. The truth is that we are prone to looking through the wrong end of the telescope. We move from man to God. But true thinking, thinking that recognizes the real distinction between the creator and the creature, between the infinite and the finite, must always begin with God. It is not so much that we describe God in anthropomorphic terms, it is that He has created us in a theomorphic way. We are the miniatures. In us, created finite people, are embedded microcosmic reflections of realities that are true of God Himself in a macrocosmic, uncreated, infinite way. Owen grasped this and says, in an admittedly intellectually challenging statement, in one essence, there can be but one person, may be true where the substance is finite and limited, but hath no place in that which is infinite. From a creaturely perspective, therefore, God's Trinitarian being is therefore not to be thought of as irrational, but as supra-rational. What is beyond human reason is not necessarily contradictory to true and ultimate reason. The finite mind cannot comprehend infinite mind. While we can apprehend God's goodness, it is clear that we cannot fully comprehend it. To think otherwise would be to fall under Martin Luther's criticism of the prominent humanist Desiderius Erasmus, 1466-1536. Your thoughts of God are too human. There are places in our quest for understanding where we reach the limits of the human mind. The finite does not have the capacity fully to grasp and understand the infinite but it is how we respond just at this point that is significant. Do we say with Nietzsche, But to reveal my entire heart to you, my friends, if there were gods, how could I stand not to be a god? Therefore, there are no gods. Or do we bow down lost in wonder, love, and praise, because we recognize we have come to the horizon of human understanding 
and can only gaze in awe at the God who is so infinitely great and glorious, and who loves and cares for us. Therein lies the difference between the approach of alienation and the approach of faith. 2. But Owen is concerned to take us beyond intellectual controversy. For far from seeing the Trinity as an impractical and abstract doctrine, it is for him, by necessity, the most practical of all doctrines, simply because knowing God is eternal life. But before we begin to explore its implications in detail, we must look at how Owen understands the Bible's teachings on the Trinity. On the Trinity Owen stands unashamedly on the shoulders of multitudes of Christians before him. He sees that the biblical teaching is in fact very straightforward. God is one. Deuteronomy 6.4, Isaiah 44.6 and 8. Yet the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each seen as divine. Not only is the Father himself God, but the New Testament applies to Jesus quotations from the Old Testament that in their original context clearly refer to the divine being. In addition, divine and personal attributes and actions are attributed to the Holy Spirit. This is why Christians are baptized into the one name that has the threefold pronunciation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18-20 Here Owen has a new twist on an observation made by the early church father Athanasius, to the effect that if the Son and the Spirit are not divine, then we are inexplicably baptized in the name of one God and two creatures. Owen notes, If those into whose name we are baptized be not one in nature, we are by our baptism engaged into the service and worship of more gods than one. But how is this a practical doctrine? For Owen, this is like asking how marriage is a practical arrangement. The presence and character of our marriage partner changes absolutely everything. He develops two aspects of Trinitarian theology, first expounded by the Church Fathers. The first is the doctrine of the works of the Trinity, opera trinitatis. The second is the doctrine of the appropriations of the persons of the Trinity, appropriationes personae. These expressions may sound obscure and complex, but they are actually very beautiful doctrines, and they open up for us in a wonderful way what it means to know God and help us to enjoy fellowship with Him. Opera Trinitatis ad extra sunt indivisa. This grand-sounding sentence is translatable with little or no knowledge of Latin. The external works of the Trinity are indivisible. This is another way of saying that when God acts, He always acts as God the Trinity. The fathers of the Church had a corresponding statement with respect to God's inner being as Trinity, implying that communications of love between any of the divine persons always engage all three persons. Paul's statement that the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, 1 Corinthians 2.10, implies as much. It means that when Jesus spoke about the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father, He did not exclude the Spirit from the mutual embrace. Indeed, Augustine had taught that in some sense the Spirit is the bond of that embrace. In all God's actions and expressions of love and purpose toward the cosmos, and especially toward men and women made in His image, each person of the Trinity is engaged. This is especially clear in His epic-making actions of creation and incarnation. The Father is the Creator, and yet He makes all things through His Son, the Word, without whom was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. But already in Genesis 1-2 we read of the Spirit of God hovering over the waters as the divine executive who superintended the original, formless, empty, dark creation in order to bring forth both form and fullness in the light of God. Later the Father sent His Son. The Son willingly came to take our flesh and bear our sins. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Likewise, in the resurrection the Father raised the Son. The Son stepped forth from the tomb, but He did so in the power of the Spirit. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Romans 1.4 Like others before him, Owen was impressed by the beautiful statement of Gregory of Nazianzus, I cannot think about the one without being instantly surrounded by the splendor of the three, nor can I discern the three without being immediately drawn back to the one.
These three, Owen says, thus know each other, love each other, delight in each other. It is not surprising, then, that Augustine wrote, In no other subject is error more dangerous, or inquiry more laborious, or the discovery of truth more profitable. There is mystery here, but it is the mystery of infinite glory, and leads to humble adoration and devotion. But there is a further aspect to the classical doctrine of the Trinity that Owen calls into service. It is this second dimension that he develops in unusual, if not unique, detail, in such a way as to lead us into a deeper appreciation of what it means to know God. This is the doctrine of appropriations. Appropriationes Personae If the doctrine of the opera trinitatis underscores the unity of the Trinity, the doctrine of the appropriations underscores the diversity of role and functions among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The doctrine means that each person expresses his specific personhood both internally, in relation to the other persons, and externally, in relation to the cosmos and especially mankind. There is a deep relationship between the dispositions and actions of each person of the Trinity and the nature of the Christian's knowledge of and fellowship with that person. Our experience of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is shaped by the specific role that each plays in relationship to our lives and especially to our salvation. This simple but stretching to the mind and affections, truth, can be simply illustrated by the confusion of speech we sometimes hear when listening to someone else pray. Either by accident, thoughtlessness, or sometimes ignorance, a person will address God as our Father in prayer and thank Him for all He has done. But then, perhaps losing the thread of what He is praying, He then thanks the Father for, among other things, dying on the cross for us. Unwittingly, He has become guilty of a well-known heresy with a sophisticated Latinate title, Patripassianism. The Father did not suffer and die for us on the cross. It was His Son Jesus Christ who did that. While it is certainly appropriate, and more than appropriate, to praise the Father for sending His Son to die for us, a moment's reflection will confirm that the Father Himself did not die. Before we move on, it is worth pausing to reflect on some of the practical implications of what has just been said. For if neither the Father nor the Spirit died for us on the cross, that means it is only the Son we praise for making such a sacrifice. We have unique reasons for thanking Him, in distinction from the Father and the Spirit, which means there is a unique element to our fellowship or communion with Him. Yet at the same time, this also suggests that there are also unique elements in our communion with the Father, Father, thank you for sending your own Son for me, and with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, thank you for being with and sustaining the Lord Jesus when He died for me on the cross. This is an ever-expanding insight. The more we reflect on the way Scripture details the activities of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the correspondingly fuller and richer our communion with God will become. It will no longer be communion with an undifferentiated being, but fellowship with a deeply personal, indeed, three-personal being in all that He is in His three persons, each one in the undivided three making Himself known to us in special and distinct ways. The Living God This for John Owen lay at the heart of what it means to know God and to enjoy communion with Him. Just as it is inconceivable that a Unitarian God could enjoy personal communion within His own being, so it is inconceivable that a Christian can enjoy communion with a God who has all kinds of attributes but can never express them within His own being. Such a God is not a living God at all, but is impersonal and static. By contrast, the God of the Bible is the living God, living in Himself, loving within His three persons, expressing all His attributes in the dynamic interplay of Father with Son, Son with Spirit, Spirit with Father, Father and Son with Spirit, Spirit and Son with Father, Father and Spirit with Son. This is what the Greek fathers of the Church called perichoresis, the moving in and out, as in a choreographed dance, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in an eternal, self-sufficient inner cosmos of love and holy devotion, and in an endless mutual knowledge. Perhaps the nearest we get to experiencing this is in the discovery of a friendship or love in which we seem both to lose and find ourselves in the apparently unending fascination and satisfaction of knowing and being known, loving and being loved by another person. 
time itself seems either to stand still or to become like an unending stream. Being seems far more significant than doing. Being together becomes an all-absorbing, all-consuming, all-demanding delight. John Owen had begun to learn from the apostles that deep down at the foundation of knowing God and living and enjoying the Christian life lay the experience of these basic truths. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 3. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This then, says Owen, farther drives on the truth that lies under demonstration, there being such a distinct communication of grace from the several persons of the deity, the saints must needs have distinct communion with them. To the rich wonder of this communion with each person of the Trinity, we must now turn. Chapter 3. Communion with the Father I am quite aware that Owen's writings are not fashionable in the present day, yet the great divine has more learning and sound knowledge of Scripture in his little finger than many who depreciate him have in their whole bodies. I assert unhesitatingly that the man who wants to study experimental theology will find no books equal to those of Owen. J. C. Ryle Communion with God is always the enjoyment of the whole Godhead, yet, as we have seen, it is also the enjoyment of each person. There is a distinct flavor about our fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. The Centrality of Love Christians enjoy fellowship with the Father in love. Yes, Scripture speaks of the love of Jesus the Son, and also of the Holy Spirit as the one who pours the love of God into our hearts. But it places special emphasis on the love of the Father that flows to us through the Son and the Spirit. Thus, when John writes, God is love, 1 John 4, 8, it is the love of God the Father that he particularly has in view, since he goes on to explain how this love has been made known to us in the way God, that is, the Father, sent His only Son into the world, 1 John 4, 9. God the Father is characterized by His infinitely gracious, tender, compassionate, and loving nature. This, Owen says, is the great discovery of the gospel. Outside of Christ, we know God only as full of wrath. We cannot think of Him in any other way. Of course, people will say that they believe in a God of love, but apart from Christ, this is either self-deceit or borrowed capital from the gospel. For apart from Christ, we can have no sure confidence of God's love. Providence is too mixed with tragedy, and history is too marred by evil for us to be able to read off its pages, God is love. If we believe that He is love on the grounds that things are going well for us, our confidence will dissolve the moment life turns sour. No, outside of Christ, the conviction that God is love is a figment of our imagination. The truth is that, outside of Christ, there lies only judgment and wrath. But the gospel gloriously affirms the love the Father has for lost sinners. He is the one who sent His Son so that we should not perish but have everlasting life. He is the one in whom we find the benediction of His love. This was the message that the Savior emphasized to His disciples before His passion and death. The Father Himself loves you. John 16, 27. Clearly, this love neither exists nor is manifested apart from the Son. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Nor do we experience it apart from the Holy Spirit. For God's love, that is, the Father's love, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, Romans 5, 5. Nevertheless, these streams of love flow to us from a fountain in God the Father. All you need is love. That is true in one sense. But love is a multifaceted term, a comprehensive description used in Scripture for a multidimensional reality. I love theology. 
I love my wife. I love my family. I love golf. And I love God. Not only is that listing not in order of priority, but my love in each instance has a distinct flavor, a different nuance ranging from enjoy to adore. So what do we mean when we speak about the love of God? We need to use a variety of categories if we are going to describe how God loves. Making Distinctions In common with other theologians who tried to think through such issues and to make careful analytical distinctions, Owen employed a series of categories to distinguish the ways we love, and especially the ways in which God loves, the love of benevolence, the love of beneficence, and the love of complacence. These categories were well summarized and described by Owen's younger contemporary, the Genevan theologian Francis Turreton, 1623-87. A threefold love of God is commonly held, or rather, there are three degrees of one and the same love. First, there is the love of benevolence by which God willed good to the creature from eternity. Second, the love of beneficence by which he does good to the creature in time according to his good will. Third, the love of complacency by which he delights himself in the creature on account of the rays of his image seen in them. By the first he elects us, by the second he redeems us and sanctifies us, but by the third he gratuitously rewards us as holy and just. John 3.13 refers to the first, Ephesians 5.25 and Revelation 1.5 to the second, Isaiah 62.3 and Hebrews 11.6 to the third. Owen uses this kind of categorization in expressions such as the love of good pleasure, the love of rest and complacency, the love of friendship, the love of assimilation, the love of approbation, and so on. Such divisions seem both frustrating and needlessly scholastic to many Christians. Scholastic is often used as a theological slur intended to introduce a bad odor. Yet the people who use it thus are sometimes the very people who become hot under the collar if strangers refer to a fastball as a slider in baseball, or confuse an eagle with a double bogey in golf, or for that matter describe someone living in the Carolinas as a Yankee or a Scot as English. Aren't these merely scholastic distinctions? To ask the question is to answer it. Right understanding always involves making careful distinctions. Of course, we must never substitute distinctions for the thing itself. We must always recognize that distinctions are simply useful ways of helping us grasp and understand the whole. This is true with the love of the Father. It is not an amorphous concept. God loves you. Owen teaches us to linger over his love, to meditate on its multifaceted nature in order to appreciate its wonder. Thus, according to Owen, we must reflect on the love he had for us before we were born, and the purposes he then planned for our lives, the love of benevolence. This divine love stretches back into eternity and downwards into time. Then there is the love that he has displayed in history in doing good to all people, the love of beneficence. And then there is the love planned in eternity and expressed in Christ that we have now come to experience, the love of complacency. It cost him dearly to love us as sinners, for it required his willingness to send his Son and give him up to the death of the cross in order to fulfill his purposes of love for us. We know that he loved us, but more than that, we now experience the love with which he loved us. He loves us with it still. Indeed, the Father himself loves us. What knowledge could be more wonderful than this? The Father comes to make his home with us. Soul Sickness and Gospel Medicine John Owen was a great multilingual and multidisciplinary scholar, but during much of his life he served either as a pastor of local congregations or in pastoral relationships with others. In addition, his spiritual pilgrimage had been by no means straightforward. His experience and his calling combined to make him deeply sensitive to a spiritual condition he observed as troubling many Christians. The observations of pastors before and since simply confirm Owen's judgment that there is a spiritual sickness that often spoils our enjoyment of fellowship with God. In his early years, Owen appears to have been troubled about his relationship to God. There is some evidence that he went through more than one period of spiritual discouragement and even depression. His first deliverance from this came, as we have seen, when a stranger substituted for Edmund Calamy 
and preached on Jesus' words to his disciples, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Matthew 8.26. The sermon was the means of leading him forth into the sunshine of a settled peace. But it was also probably the reason why Owen developed a lifelong concern for others who had little or no sense of peace with God. Owen refers to this problem several times in the context of his exposition of communion with the Father in love. The problem, as he sees it, surely rightly, is that many Christians, in their heart of hearts, are not deeply convinced that the Father indeed loves them. An extended quotation from Owen will make his point clear. There is a twofold divine love, beniplacti and amicitiae, a love of good pleasure and destination, and a love of friendship and approbation. They are both peculiarly assigned to the Father in an imminent manner. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave, etc. That is, with the love of his purpose and good pleasure, his determinant will of doing good. This is distinctly ascribed to him, being laid down as the cause of sending his Son. John 14.23, there is mention of that other kind of love whereof we speak. If a man love me, saith Christ, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. The love of friendship and approbation is here eminently ascribed to him. Says Christ, we will come, even Father and Son, to such a one, and dwell with him, that is, by the Spirit. But yet he, Jesus, would have us take notice that, in point of love, the Father hath a peculiar prerogative. My Father will love him. 6. Yea, and as this love is peculiarly to be eyed in him, so it is to be looked on as the fountain of all following gracious dispositions. Christians walk oftentimes with exceedingly troubled hearts concerning the thoughts of the Father towards them. They are well persuaded of the Lord Christ and his good will. The difficulty lies in what is their acceptance with the Father. From time to time in the enormous mass of Owen's writings, one catches a sense of passionate relentlessness. He will not let go of a theme until he has exhausted it. This is one of those places. Owen is like a physician facing an almost intractable disease who is determined to find a diagnosis and then prescribe a cure. What exactly is the problem here? There are Christians who are not deeply convinced of the love that their Heavenly Father has for them. They may grasp the love of Christ, but there seems to be a cognitive gap or a dissonance between their trust in Him and their trust in the Father. It is almost as though they fear that behind Christ, the Father is actually distant and dark, even sinister. Many dark and disturbing thoughts are apt to arise in this thing. Few can carry up their hearts and minds to this height by faith as to rest their souls in the love of the Father. They live below it in the troublesome region of hopes and fears, storms and clouds. All here is serene and quiet, but how to attain to this pitch they know not. Again later on, Owen circles the wagons one more time. How few of the saints are experimentally acquainted with this privilege of holding immediate communion with the Father in love. With what anxious, doubtful thoughts do they look upon him? What fears, what questionings are there of his goodwill and kindness? At the best, many think there is no sweetness at all in him towards us, but what is purchased at the high price of the blood of Jesus. It is true, that alone is the way of communication, but the free fountain and spring of all is in the bosom of the Father. What is the problem Owen detects? We might call it serpent theology, for the record of the first attack on the relationship between God and His image-bearing son and daughter has this in view. What is the nature of the attack? In formal terms, the serpent's words cast doubt on the content truthfulness, and reliability of God's word. Did God actually say? And when Eve responds that God had said that they would die if they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. But woven into the serpent's approach is a more subtle activity rooted in a more sinister motive. His twisting of the word of God is designed to distort the character of God in Eve's eyes. God had given them the fruit of all the trees in the garden to enjoy. Only one tree in the entire orchard was forbidden. This was overwhelmingly generous and a simple, easily managed negative command. Clearly, the Heavenly Father wanted His children to show their love, trust, and obedience to Him by simply doing what He told them. 
In this way, they would grow strong in faith as they gave glory to God. Obedience to His command could only strengthen their trust and love. But the serpent adeptly twisted the command. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Genesis 3.1 How mean and despicable if He had issued such a command! But the serpent's question was, of course, a subtle but hate-motivated innuendo intended to distort the character and motives of the great, gracious, kind, generous Creator. He doesn't really love you, was the implication. He was encouraging them to complain to God. You never give us anything to enjoy. Alas, despite Eve's initial rejoinder, the serpent succeeded. The upshot was this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Romans 1.25 The lie was this, the Father doesn't really love you. In fact, He is malevolent toward you. He begrudges you any enjoyment, restricts your life, and, in a word, is a hard taskmaster. The consequence of Eve's dismal failure was the entry into the human psyche, now distorted by sin and the fall, of a twisted and perverse view of the character of God. Now He has become policeman, spoiler, divine scrooge, His honor and glory are now seen, by definition, as the enemy of our freedom and joy. Yes, people will tell us they believe in a God of love, but they are self-deceived and their lives reveal it. They neither love Him with heart, soul, mind, and strength in return, nor do they worship Him with zeal and energy. The truth is that their mantra, My God is a God of love, is a smokescreen, a phantasm of their imagination. Underneath it all is a deep mistrust of God. Otherwise, why not yield the whole of life in joyful abandon to whatever he says or asks? Christ gives us hints of how well he himself understood this. The returning prodigal in the parable, Luke 15, through 32 spends the journey home rehearsing his speech, Treat me as one of your hired servants. He does not expect to see his aged father gathering up his robes and breaching social etiquette by running down the hill, embracing and kissing him, and then celebrating his return. No, righteous Jewish etiquette required a shaming ceremony, not a homecoming party. The stay-at-home, never-do-anything-wrong older son shares the same spirit. Look, these many years I have served you, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends, he complains. He sees himself as a slave, not as a son. He has no sense of the Father's love. Strikingly, Jesus paints a picture of the same spirit in his parable of the Minas, in which the servant, rather than using his master's wealth productively, returns it still in the handkerchief in which he had hidden it. Why? I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. Luke 19.21 He says this to the master, who has just told the servant who turned his mina into five minas, that he will become mayor of five cities. The only relationship between five minas and five cities is the number five. This is reward out of all proportion to accomplishment. He is hardly a severe man. Indeed, he is the most generous of masters. Yet this is our natural condition. This is how we think of the Father. Our hearts are closed to him because we think his heart is closed to us. Owen sees this with great clarity. Moreover, he knows that this mistrust may not be entirely dissolved by regeneration. It lingers on and plagues many Christians still. It has been a lifelong addiction. It may remain an ongoing tendency. The seed of this disease of the soul is already in us and may flare up again and again. But there is more, and Owen has hinted at it in words already quoted. What fears, what questionings are there of his goodwill and kindness? At the best, many think there is no sweetness at all in him towards us, but what is purchased at the high price of the blood of Jesus. It is true that the blood of Jesus alone is the means of communication, but the free fountain and spring of love is in the bosom of the Father. But why is it, then, that people think less of the Father's love? It is in part because sometimes this is how the gospel is preached. God loves you because His Son Jesus died for you, so trust Him as your Savior. But, in fact, this is not how the New Testament presents the gospel. This popular presentation misrepresents the gospel, It turns it on its head and feeds mistrust of the Father. It implies the very thing Owen believed to be so damaging to the soul's relationship to God, namely the belief that there is no sweetness at all in Him, the Father, towards us, but what is purchased at the high price of the blood of Jesus. 
Here, a loving Savior is seen to persuade a reluctant, even bitter father to be gracious. Jesus buys his father's love at infinite cost. But contrast this with the gospel teaching. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, therefore, by definition, God here means the father, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 There is no gap between the love of the Father and that of the Son. Christ died for us because the Father loves us, not in order to induce or persuade our reluctant Father to love us. All the love for us that we see in Jesus is the Father's love too. Yes, it is expressed by and revealed in the death of Christ, but it is not purchased by it. Indeed, the Father's love is antecedent to the work of Christ. The Father's love is the sine qua non of the work of Christ for us, for the Father himself loves you, John 16, 27. It is not surprising that when this malaise remains in the soul, the joy, peace, energy, worship, and witness of the Christian are all adversely affected. Spiritual anemia is the result. Owen, therefore, wants to prescribe medicine for sick Christian hearts, a gospel tonic that will put us on our feet and fill us with joy and assurance. What do we need? We need to take daily doses of the Father's love and reflect on the high privilege of being His adopted children. Jesus is the beam, but the Father Himself is the Son of eternal love. Christ is the stream, but through Him we are led to the Father, who is the fountain of all grace and kindness. He is as a father, a mother, a shepherd, a hen over chickens, and the like. How is the remedy to be taken? And how will it restore us to the wonder of communion with God the Father? Owen's prescription is that we must first receive and then return the Father's love. The Reception and Return of Love We receive the Father's love by faith. He has demonstrated His love in Christ. In love, He sent His Son for us. By Christ's death, all cause for the Father's wrath against us is removed. If the Father did not spare His Son, but gave him up to the cross for us, we can reach only one conclusion. The Father will graciously supply all of our needs. We have every reason to trust him. Not only so, but God's love for us is not limited to benefaction, the plan of salvation designed to do us good. It is also a love of complacency, in the word's original sense of satisfaction. This is implied in the apparent mixing of metaphors in the words of Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Thus our task is to eye the Father's love. Our problem has been that our gaze has been fixed either on our own sin, we are unlovely and unlovable, or like a person with a squint, we have looked past rather than at the love of our Father. Instead, we are meant to fix our eyes on Christ, so that they may be raised through him to the Father's love that is demonstrated in him. To change the metaphor, we are to drink so deeply of God's love in Christ that we reach the head of the waters found in the heart of the Father. When the eye of faith sees the Father's love, the mouth of faith will drink deeply of the streams of grace. As we do so, we not only receive his love, but we also find ourselves inevitably, irresistibly returning his love. And, wonderfully, just as Christ is the one through whom the Father's love comes to us, so in Christ our love is returned to the Father. It should not escape our notice that this, in turn, takes place through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here the choreography of the Trinity brings love down from heaven to earth, and then, as though the music accompanying the dance of grace now indicates that the direction of the dance is reversed, our love is returned to the Father through the Son by the inner ministry of the Spirit. Yes, the Father's love for us and ours for Him differ. His is a love of bounty, ours is a love of duty, albeit love, not duty, is its motive. His love is antecedent to ours, our love is consequent to His. Our love goes to Him, although we were once haters of God. His has come to us because He is a lover of man. We love the Lord because He has first loved us. His love is, like Him, unchanging and unchangeable. Ours is mutable. He may not always smile out his love to us, but he never ceases actually to love us. If only we contemplated, 
eyed this love clearly, Owen comments, our souls, could not bear an hour's absence from him. For this is the love of the all-sufficient, infinitely satiated, satisfied, with himself and his own glorious excellencies and perfections, who hath no need to go forth with his love unto others, nor to seek an object of it without, outside, himself. He is sufficient unto his own love. He had his Son also, his eternal wisdom, to rejoice and delight himself in from all eternity. This might take up and satiate the whole delight of the Father. But Owen adds, He will love his saints also. This is indeed free love. There is nothing in us that causes it. It is from him alone. Thus delivered from the deceit of Satan, we grow in communion with our Heavenly Father and discover with David, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Psalm 63, 2-4 Thus, when the soul sees God in his dispensation of love to be infinitely lovely and loving, rests upon him and delights in him as such, then hath it communion with him in love. Now that he has taught us thus to delight in our Father's love, Owen wants to lead us on further, for in Jesus Christ there is grace upon grace. Chapter 4 Communion with the Son Dr. Owen's is indeed a venerated name, which stands in the first rank of those noble worthies who adorned a former period of our country and of our church. He was a star of the first magnitude in that bright constellation of luminaries who shed a light and a glory on the age in which they lived, and whose genius and whose writings continue to shed their radiance over succeeding generations. Thomas Chalmers God the Father calls us into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Paul's words of thanksgiving for God's work among the Corinthians seem so simple, so commonplace, that it would be easy for us to take them for granted and gloss over them. But for John Owen, the Apostle's statement serves as the open door into all the treasures of grace and blessing that are ours through faith. All that God has for us in His Son Jesus is condensed in this apparently simple statement. For to become a Christian means to have fellowship with Christ in all that He has accomplished for us. Indeed, Christ Himself invites us to sit with Him and sup with Him. This is what Paul prays will be ours in his Trinitarian benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 13.14. Grace and Justification But what is this grace? From one perspective, it is the fulfillment of everything to which the Old Testament pointed in its patterns, promises, types, and history. The law was given through Moses, John explained, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John 1.17. It is not that the Old Covenant was devoid of grace, but true, real, full, embodied grace came only in the one whom the Old Covenant anticipated. Owen, however, presents us with a vital additional emphasis. It ranks among one of the most important insights in all of his theology. Grace is, ultimately, personal. Grace is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's grace. For grace is not substantial in the sense of being a quality or entity that can be abstracted from the person of the Savior. Indeed, Owen says, Paul is so delighted with this grace of Christ that he makes it his motto, and the token whereby he would have his epistles known. 2 Thessalonians 3, 17 and 18 The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Yea, he makes these two, grace be with you and the Lord Jesus be with you, to be equivalent expressions. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of these words. Owen was writing against the background of the theological categories employed in medieval theology, many of which he inherited. The medieval understanding of salvation was dominated by sacramental grace, from its first infusion at baptism until its hoped-for conclusion in a faith fully formed by perfect love for God. This fides caritate formata, as it was known, or perfect love for God, rendered the individual justifiable on the basis of what grace had now accomplished in him or her. The net result was spiritually disastrous for at least two reasons. One, 
Who could ever claim that grace had worked in them a love for God so perfect that on that basis God could justify them as wholly righteous? Even in the Roman Catholic Church, the only people who can make such a claim are the rarest of people worthy to be canonized as saints, in a quite different sense from the New Testament use of the term. And yes, perhaps those to whom God gave a special revelation of Himself. But the net result of this plan of salvation was that very few could ever, in this life, enjoy the assurance of salvation. Indeed, as Cardinal Robert Bellarmine insisted, such assurance was the greatest of all Protestant heresies. 2. In keeping with this, grace was viewed virtually as a commodity to be dispensed by the church through its priests and sacraments. It might be resourced in Christ, but in itself it was something impersonal, a commodity, not the loving, caring, sacrificing, keeping, gracious Savior himself. Thus Owen's great burden and emphasis in helping us to understand what it means to be a Christian is to say, through the work of the Spirit, the Heavenly Father gives you to Jesus and gives Jesus to you. You have Him. Everything you can ever lack is found in Him. All you will ever need is given to you in Him. From His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. John 1, 16. For the Father has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3. It is as true for the newest, weakest Christian as for the most mature believer. From the first moment of faith we are fully, finally, irreversibly justified in Christ. In this way, like Calvin before him, at a stroke, Owen transforms our understanding of the nature of grace and salvation. To explore fellowship with Christ, then, means that we need to explore both the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, with whom we have fellowship, and how it is that we have fellowship with Him in His grace. For Owen, Christ's grace is multidimensional. It consists in His personal graciousness and attractiveness as the Mediator and Savior, in His favor and love toward us as sinners, and in His transforming us through the gift of His Spirit. Thus, to appreciate what it means to have fellowship with Him involves coming to understand how and why it is that He is able to save us. Here, Owen leads us to the very fountainhead of grace in the person of Christ. Christ is able to save us because He has united our human nature to His own divine nature in His one divine person as the Son of God. We modern Christians are inclined to think of such language as this as belonging to the remote ivory tower world of ancient theology. In all likelihood, Owen would be disposed to tell us, rightly, that we therefore know very little about either ancient theology or ancient theologians. This classical way of thinking about Christ was not developed in the security of academia, but on the battlegrounds of gospel witness and church life, where thinking Christians were willing to suffer for the sake of rightly understanding and describing their beloved Savior. Owen belonged to their guild where a passion to know and love Christ drove a desire to describe Him rightly in order to know and love Him more. In this context, Owen well understood that unless Christ were truly and fully God and truly and fully man, He could not have been fitted or equipped to save us. This truth Owen saw embedded in the teaching of the New Testament, and nowhere more clearly than in the letter to the Hebrews. It was only as the God-man that the Lord Jesus had room enough in his breast to receive and power enough in his spirit to bear all the wrath that was prepared for us. Since all the fullness of God dwells in him, and he received the Spirit without measure, Hebrews 7.25, John 3.34, his bearing the judgment of God on the cross could not exhaust and destroy him. Because he is so perfectly suited to our needs, therefore, Christ endears himself to believers. He is just what we need, and he is all that we need. There is no man that hath any want in reference unto the things of God, but Christ will be unto him that which he wants. I speak of those who are given him of his Father. Is he dead? Christ is life. Is he weak? Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Hath he the sense of guilt upon him? Christ is complete righteousness. He hath a fitness to save, having pity and ability, tenderness and power, to carry on that work to the uttermost and a fullness to save, of redemption and sanctification, or righteousness and the Spirit, and a suitableness to the wants of all our souls. From beginning to end, therefore, communion with Christ is all about Christ. When He fills the horizon of our vision, we find ourselves drawn to Him, embraced by Him, 
and beginning to enjoy Him. Communion with Christ in Personal Grace The New Testament's most frequent and indeed most basic description of the believer is that he or she is a person in Christ. The expression and its variants overwhelmingly dominate the teaching of the apostles. And one of the clues Scripture gives to help us understand what this means is to express our union with Christ in terms of what Owen calls conjugal relations, or, as we would say, marriage. Through the ministry of the Spirit and by faith, we become united to Christ, one with Christ, in the way a man and a woman become one flesh in the marriage bond. This picture, already present in the Old Testament, Isaiah 54, 5, 61, 10, 62, 5, Ezekiel 16, 1 through 22, comes to fulfillment in the new in the relationship between Christ and His church. Christ rejoiced in this prospect in eternity, and He has made it a reality in time, enduring the humiliation, pain, and anguish of the cross. Christ, in all His saving grace and personal attractiveness, is offered to us in the gospel. The Father brings to His Son the bride He has prepared for Him, and asks both parties if they will have each other, the Savior if He will have sinners to be His, sinners if they will embrace the Lord Jesus as their Savior, husband, and friend. Like many of his contemporaries, Owen saw this spiritual union and communion between Christ and the believer foreshadowed and described in the Old Testament book, The Song of Solomon. His exposition of the attractiveness of Christ to the Christian is heavily influenced by the descriptions of the lover and his expressions of affection of the beloved. Though his analysis was typical for his day, few commentators today would follow him in the details of his exegesis. But what is paramount and striking in Owen's thinking is that being a Christian involves a deep affection for Christ. He is a person to be known, admired, and loved. Fellowship with Christ, therefore, involves a mutual resignation or self-giving between ourselves and Him. There is endless, bottomless, boundless grace and compassion in Christ, a fullness of grace in the human nature of Christ of such proportions that, says Owen, in a stunning outburst of wonder and praise, if all the world, if I may so say, set themselves to drink free grace, mercy, and pardon, drawing water continually from the wells of salvation, if they should set themselves to draw from one single promise an angel standing by and crying, Drink, O my friends, yea, drink abundantly, take so much grace and pardon as shall be abundantly sufficient for the world of sin which is in every one of you, they would not be able to sink the grace of the promise one hair's breadth. There is enough for millions of worlds, if they were, because it flows into it from an infinite, bottomless fountain. Thus to become a Christian is, for Owen, to feel the weight of the Lord's words in Hosea 3.3, 3, as if spoken personally to us. You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore, or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. In response, we yield our wills to Christ and to the way of salvation God has provided in Him, and say, Lord, I would have had Thee and salvation in my way, that it might have been partly of mine endeavors, and, as it were, by the works of the law. I am now willing to receive Thee and to be saved in Thy way, merely by grace, and though I would have walked according to my own mind, yet now I wholly give up myself to be ruled by Thy Spirit, for in Thee have I righteousness and strength. In thee am I justified and do glory. Then doth it carry on communion with Christ as to the graces of his person. This it is to receive the Lord Jesus in his comeliness and eminency. Let believers exercise their hearts abundantly unto this thing. This is choice communion with the Son, Jesus Christ. It is surely difficult for us to read passages like this, however quaint the language may seem at first, without feeling our hearts bursting as they seek to take in the sheer magnitude of what has happened to us in our coming to faith in such a Savior. We cannot spread our sin further than He can spread His grace. To meditate on this, to taste the waters of such a pure fountain, is surely to know joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. 1 Peter 1, nine. Affectionate Communion the reader of any work by John Owen is immediately struck by the sense of encountering an intellect of massive strength. All the more reason, therefore, to notice the emphasis he places on the role of the affections in the life of the Christian. 
Owen and many of his contemporaries thought of human nature as a psychosomatic unity of body and soul. We have both physical and spiritual dimensions. Analyzing further how we function as human beings, they described the spiritual dimension in terms of mind, will, and affections. In this threefold distinction, we find an important clue to how Owen understands communion with Christ. It does indeed involve our understanding of who Christ is and what He has done. It also includes a willingness to give ourselves unreservedly to Him. But our communion with Him also enlivens and transforms the Christian's affections. We are often and rightly reminded that we do not live the Christian life on the basis of our emotions, but we must never make the mistake of thinking that the gospel leaves our emotions untouched. Rather, it cleanses and transforms them by its power. We come to love what we formerly hated and to delight in what we formerly despised. Indeed, we experience what Owen calls suitable consequential affections toward Christ in light of his affectionate love for us. Christ delights in us. Owen delights to see the way this is expressed by Zephaniah. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Zephaniah 3.17 Christ reveals his secrets to his people and thus transforms their relationship with him from that of servants to friends because they know what their master is doing. John 15, 13 through 15. How could he who lays down his life for us keep anything back from us that would be for our joy and lead to his pleasure and joy in us? In turn, we find Christ becomes our delight, even, or especially, in our weakness, his spirit helps us. Romans 8, 26 and 27. He prays when we have no words to pray. Thus, one of the features of the spiritually minded believer is that his desires are greater than his words. By contrast, the person who does not delight in Christ will pray with words that far exceed his desires. Before we were united to Christ, we could not delight in him because we were shut up under sin. But now we delight in the new and living way that has been opened up for us to come to God through our Savior. We can now approach the throne of heaven with boldness. We are, Owen notes, like the beloved in the Song of Solomon, with great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Song of Solomon 2, 3b and 4 Owen is not slow to mention that such spiritual delight in Christ has a powerful moral effect on our lives. He writes tellingly, The line of choicest communion is a line of the greatest spiritual solicitousness, carelessness in the enjoyment of Christ pretended, is a manifest evidence of a false heart. We have come to delight in Christ only when we have begun to live for Christ and a new sensitivity to and distaste for sin has been produced in us by His delight in us and ours in Him. This is how love functions. When once the soul of a believer hath obtained sweet and real communion with Christ, it looks about him, watcheth all temptations, always whereby sin might approach to disturb him in his enjoyment of his dear Lord and Savior, his rest and desire. How doth it charge itself not to omit anything, nor to do anything that may interrupt the communion obtained? He adds in vivid picture language that conjures up what spiritual solicitousness looks like in practice, a believer that hath gotten Christ in his arms is like one that hath found great spoils, or a pearl of price. He looks about him every way, and fears every thing that may deprive him of it. Rather than producing carelessness, spiritual delight produces carefulness. It is because of this that the believer will place himself in a church context where all of the instruments of the Lord's blessing, worship, fellowship, the ministry of the Word, and the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, can be experienced. Christ blesses us in other ways and by other means, but only when we are walking in the ways and means He has prepared for us. Our Worth in His Sight We live in a time when the self-worth and self-image of young people has become a major concern. Governments and institutions invest vast amounts of capital and human resources into dealing with the problem. It should not surprise biblically instructed Christians that the results are in inverse proportion to the investment. Telling young people that they are important, you can become anything you want, you are our nation's future leaders, they are told, is clearly rhetoric designed to encourage a sense of self-worth. But the first statement is false, 
For instance, under normal circumstances, only one person can become president every four years. Since there is a lower age limit of 35 to becoming president in the average lifespan, a maximum of 11 out of all our contemporaries can achieve that office. The second statement leads to inevitable disappointment for many. For if all are leaders in the nation, who will follow? It need hardly be said that Christian parents can swallow the same secular mythology and assure their children that they, the parents, are preparing them for leadership. Scripture nowhere teaches us to do that. If anything, it teaches the reverse. We are training our children not for leadership but for service. If leadership, language almost entirely absent from the New Testament, follows, well and good. So this modern self-worth mythology of some secular psychologists and educationalists, that we are all princesses and presidents-in-waiting, is doomed to failure. Yet precisely in this area we find Owen, this colossus of 17th century theology, in the midst of lengthy paragraphs of Latinate sentences pointing us to the gospel answer to a contemporary epidemic. Our true worth is found in the value Christ has placed upon us, not in the valuation of our self-assessment. It is what He has done, and who He is as the one who has done it, that gives us real value and creates a sense of worth in us. For us, Christ was willing to become flesh. For us, He emptied Himself into human nature. For us, He became poor. For us, He was willing for His glory to be eclipsed. For us, He became a servant, drinking the cup of divine judgment and bearing the curse of God. 1. All that He parted with all, all that He did, all that He suffered, all that He doth as mediator, He parted with all, did, suffered, doth, on the account of His love to and esteem of believers. He parted with the greatest glory, He underwent the greatest misery, He doth the greatest works that ever were, because He loves His spouse, because He values believers. What can more, what can farther be spoken? How little is the depth of which is spoken fathomed? How unable we are to look into the mysterious recesses of it! He so loves, so values His saints, as that, having from eternity undertaken to bring them to God, He rejoices His soul in the thoughts of it, and pursues His design through heaven and hell, life and death, by suffering and doing, in mercy and with power, and ceaseth not until he bring it to perfection. For, two, he doth so value them, as that he will not lose any of them to eternity, though all the world should combine to take them out of his hand. Here we discover a Christ valuation of ourselves that is calculated to dissolve all false self-worth, and yet preserve us from pride. Christ's way of giving us worth has all the marks of divine genius. We exult in our privileges. He receives all the glory. We become royal children by His gift and grant, and so all self-valuation, for good or ill, is dissolved in His supreme valuation. And in turn, this, inevitably, surely, leads to the value we place on Christ and share with the psalmist. We have none in heaven beside Him, and none on earth we desire like Him. Psalm 73:25. We value Him above all and count everything as loss by comparison. Philippians 3.8 Christ and a dungeon, Christ and a cross, is infinitely sweeter than a crown, a scepter without Him, to their souls. A despising of all things for Christ is the very first lesson of the gospel. Christ parted with everything for us, but He will never part with us. As a husband, He communion with Christ in purchased grace. Christ comes to us through His Spirit and draws us into communion with Himself. But to borrow Calvin's fine expression, He comes to us clothed with His gospel. He is not a mystical Christ, but an incarnate Christ. He is one and the same Lord and Christ who was conceived, born, baptized, tempted, suffered, died, was buried, rose, ascended, and now reigns at the right hand of His Father. To speak of His purchased grace, then, is simply to underline that our koinonia, or fellowship with Him, implies that there is almost nothing that Christ hath done which is a spring of that grace whereof we speak, but we are said to do it with Him. The privileges we enjoy, then, in Christ are shaped and determined by what He did as our representative and substitute. This Owen sees as three-dimensional, Christ's obedient life, His atoning death, and His ongoing intercession. 
Only as we view Christ, or I Him, to use Owen's preferred expression, in these ways, do we come to appreciate how His work for us reshapes our lives. In Scripture, obedience is a fundamental category for interpreting the work of Christ. It is implied in the fact that He is the servant of the Lord, and His work is specifically described in terms of His obedience to His Father. The Holy Son assumed our frail flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary, where it was sanctified by the Spirit from the beginning. His whole life was marked by a habit or disposition of obedience. More specifically, the Lord Jesus was actually obedient to the law of God, whether the law of nature that Adam was called to obey, or the law of Moses with all its distinctives governing the epoch from Moses to his own coming, or the specific law governing his work as mediator. In The Privileges of Communion with Christ How do we come to enjoy communion with Christ, and what are the privileges and joys it brings to us? Communion, in its very nature, is two-sided. God's covenant relationship with His people, even when unilaterally established, I will be your God, was always bilateral in its realization, you will be my people. Something is required on both sides for covenant fellowship and communion to be enjoyed. The same is true of our koinonia with the Lord Jesus. Christ has already done everything that is required on His part. He has both kept the law for us and suffered for us in order to bring us absolution and righteousness. Now, through the gospel, He offers Himself to us as a Savior and Master, and promises the enlivening power of the Spirit to seal our union with Him. Is anything, then, required on our part? Although Christ has paid the penalty for our sin, we are not actually pardoned and justified until we are united to Him. True, Christ has been absolved and justified as our representative, so that ultimately the Trinity should be glorified in our salvation, and we ourselves come into a full enjoyment of it. But until we are in Christ, His righteousness is not yet ours. We remain, by nature, children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 3. How then does this two-sided communion become a reality on both sides? 1. Jesus Christ gives us His righteousness and removes our defilement. He provides us with a. A new acceptance with God through the double imputation of our sin to Christ and His righteousness to us. Guilt is removed and friendship is begun. b. The new acceptability before God through the cleansing of the pollution of our hearts and the guilt of our past sin. 2. Christians, in response, approve of the divine way of justification. We, for our part, see, first of all, our need for receiving as a gift the righteousness before God that we lack in ourselves. We recognize that our own righteousness is of no value as a whole or in any part. We are hopelessly and helplessly undone, incapable of weaving for ourselves a garment of righteousness. The gospel comes to us in our sense of spiritual bankruptcy to offer us another's righteousness in place of our own unrighteousness. Christ has obeyed in our place and died in our stead. We see in the cross the amazing power and wisdom of God. He has devised a plan that preserves His absolute justice, demonstrates His love, and brings Him glory, yet simultaneously deals with our guilt and brings us salvation. The cross becomes to us the trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. We now also sing, Upon a life I did not live, Upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Owen leads us to see in the cross such a demonstration of the love of God that Paul was required to ransack the vocabulary of love to describe its wonder. Here, in Titus 3, 4-7, through is use made of every word almost whereby the exceeding rich grace, kindness, mercy, and goodness of God may be expressed, all concurring in this work, goodness, benignity, readiness to communicate of himself, and his good things that may be profitable to us, mercy, love, and propensity of mind to help, assist, relieve, mercy, forgiveness, compassion, tenderness to them that suffer, free pardoning bounty, undeserved love. Grasp this, and joy breaks forth in the heart. Here at last is peace and security with God. Owen waxes eloquent with language that surely expresses the wonder of his own experience in discovering the power of the truth of the gospel. Now, believers, remember what was their state and condition while they went about to set up a righteousness of their own and were not subject to the righteousness of Christ, how miserably they were tossed up and down with conflicting thoughts. Sometimes they had hope and sometimes were full of fear. 
Sometimes they thought themselves in some good condition, and anon were at the very brink of hell, their consciences being racked and torn with sin and fear. But now, being justified by faith, they have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. All is quiet and serene. Not only that storm is over, but they are in the haven where they would be. They have abiding peace with God. Knowing the story of Owen's own spiritual pilgrimage and the significance for him of the story of Christ stilling the storm, these words are doubly impressive. He knew whereof he spoke. He remembered the wormwood and the gall. He had been in the boat. He had cried out. The Savior had brought him peace at last. The storm was over. But something else characterizes real communion in Christ's righteousness. We bless God not only because of the effect of Christ's righteousness on us, but also because Christ's gaining it for us is the divinely planned means of exalting and honoring Him. In the very embracing of Christ for ourselves, we realize that the Savior is found to be great and glorious in Himself, honored by His Father with the name above all names, adored by angels and worshipped by saints both on earth and in heaven, Philippians 2, 5-11, Revelation 5, 8-14. And through him, God the Blessed Trinity in each of his three persons is exceedingly glorified in the pardon, justification, and acceptance of poor sinners. The Great Exchange So the Great Exchange, or commutation, takes place. We take what is Christ's, and he takes what is ours. Christ's righteousness for our sinfulness. In our sin, guilt, and shame, he summons us to come to him. Why? What to do? Why, this is mine, saith Christ, this agreement I made with my Father, that I should come and take thy sins and bear them away, they were my lot. Give me thy burden, give me all thy sins. Thou knowest not what to do with them, I know how to dispose of them well enough, so that God shall be glorified, and thy soul delivered. Thus we see that Christ really has taken our place. In our place, he has answered all the claims against us of the law we have broken, and in response, we receive Him by faith. We lay our sin on His shoulders on the cross, giving it up entirely to Him. And though we do this in a once-for-all sense in coming to Him, this becomes the ongoing daily rhythm of our lives. What we need to grasp is that nothing could more delight the Lord Jesus than that we should give our sins and ourselves to Him. This honors Him as our Savior. Not to do so would be to dishonor Him. In turn, when we experience this, we see his true worth at last. The result? Who would not love him? I have been with the Lord Jesus, may the poor soul say. I have left my sins, my burden with him, and he hath given me his righteousness, wherewith I am going with boldness to God. I was dead, and am alive, for he died for me. I was cursed, and am blessed, for he was made a curse for me. I was troubled, but have peace, for the chastisement of my peace was upon him. I knew not what to do, nor whither to cause my sorrow to go. By him have I received joy unspeakable and glorious. If I do not love him, delight in him, obey him, live to him, die for him, I am worse than the devils in hell. This is to give Christ, who has preeminence over all things, the preeminence in our hearts, so that, as Owen vividly puts it, he is no longer jostled up and down among other things. As we meditate on this, now from the perspective of our own sinfulness, and then from the perspective of Christ's saving grace, we will more and more come to enjoy the fullness of His love in ongoing communion with Him. The Habit of Grace Christ sends His Holy Spirit to His people in keeping with His promise that the Spirit who was with the disciples in the person of the Lord Jesus would come to indwell and transform them. The Father in due course put the Spirit into the hand of Christ for us. The result is that we are renewed and subsequently begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit. The habit of grace is produced in us, that is, a new, gracious spiritual life or principle created and bestowed on the soul, whereby it is changed in all its faculties and affections, fitted and enabled to go forth in the way of obedience unto every divine object that is proposed unto it, according to the mind of God. This habitual grace is not to be identified with the indwelling Spirit Himself, but is produced by His ministry in us. It is rather the creation by Christ and through the Spirit a new disposition in the believer. For that reason, we need to think of it as a gift of Christ, purchased at the high cost of His death, and thus to value it. 
we then come to see the Lord Jesus as the great Joseph that hath the disposal of all the granaries of the kingdom of heaven committed unto him. We also come to see Christ as our Savior, who, having shed his precious blood for us, now sprinkles us with it to cleanse us. For in his grace, Christ not only pardons past sins, but also sanctifies our present imperfect works. This enhances our delight in the new relationship we enjoy with the Father in and through His Son. For the Father sees us and all we do through the lens of our union and fellowship with Christ. He not only covers our bad works, He adorns our good works. This is grace indeed, and delivers us from that inherent suspicion of God that Owen seems to have frequently encountered in his ministry. Rather than hiding His grace gift in the sand out of fear and paralysis because of our sinful hearts, we discover that, like the loving Father He is, He is pleased with the lives and deeds of His children, imperfect though they are, so that the saints' good works shall meet them one day with a changed countenance, that they shall scarce know them, that which seemed to them to be black, deformed, defiled, shall appear beautiful and glorious, they shall not be afraid of them, but rejoice to see and follow them. Christ also cleanses us inwardly, we are washed and sanctified in Him, 1 Corinthians 1.30, Titus 3.6. In addition, a new principle dominates our lives. In what Thomas Chalmers would later call the expulsive power of a new affection, our lives become characterized by opposition to our sin as we rest in Christ, and grace dwells and works in us. In the understanding, it is light, in the will, obedience, in the affections, love, in all, faith. Yet this communion is by no means static. It is a communion enjoyed through faith. Without Christ, we can do nothing, John 15, 5. Every new act of obedience involves a new experience of Christ's grace. Adoption, Our Highest Privilege To contemplate all the privileges of communion with Christ would be, Owen says, work for a man's whole life. Yet these are all summed up in what he regards as the head, the spring, and fountain whence they all arise and flow. This, the highest privilege of all, is adoption into the family of God with all the rights and privileges of knowing Him as our Heavenly Father. Outside of Christ, we were strangers to the family of God both on earth and in heaven. But now we are brought near and made heirs. In Christ, the Son, we have become the adopted sons of God. Adoption is the authoritative translation of a believer, by Jesus Christ, from the family of the world and Satan into the family of God, with his investiture in all the privileges and advantages of that family. Thus we enter into the manifold privileges that belong to the royal children of the heavenly king. At first glance, it may seem strange that Owen discusses the theme of adoption within the context of communion with the Son. Adoption, after all, is by definition an act of the Father, and its confirmation is effected by the Spirit in his capacity as the Spirit of Sonship. But Owen's reasoning is fairly obvious. In union and communion with Christ, we become joint heirs with Him. So while each of the divine persons plays his particular role in adoption, it is appropriate to discuss adoption as the highest privilege of our union with Christ. But in what do we enjoy communion as adopted children? Owen gives a fourfold answer. 1. We enjoy the liberty of the children of God. We are set free from the hold of the old family. No longer is its influence dominant even if we are not entirely free from its atmosphere and even its menacing influence. There is all the difference in the world between obeying the Father who has given His Son for us, so that we can be sure He will also give us everything we need, and being in bondage to the law while making our best efforts to keep it. Two, we have a new title, and His royal sons enjoy a feast of fat things, not least in the church, where we have the privilege of belonging to the family of God and being served by and in turn loving and serving its members. More than that, there is a sense in which the whole world is ours to enjoy, because it belongs to and is preserved by our Father. No child in this family can ever justly complain that his father has set up a restrictive regime without pleasures and joy. Isaac Watts was surely reflecting on this when he wrote, The men of grace have found glory begun below, celestial fruits on earthly ground from faith and hope may grow. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly ground or walk the golden streets. 3. We experience boldness before the face of God. In Christ we are righteous as He is before God. 
we have the privilege of calling Him Abba, Father. We can ask anything in Jesus' name. What more could we ask for? 4. We experience affliction. But for the child of God, affliction is always chastisement, the action of the Father. This, as Owen rightly points out, is precisely the burden of Hebrews 12:5 through 11 It is one of the chief distinctions between Christians and unbelievers. The latter seek but do not find any ultimate meaning in their suffering. As a result, unbelievers must attempt to create meaning. But not so Christians, for Scripture teaches them that, in Christ, trials have a goal. God is treating His people as sons by training them. Were He indifferent to us in our sin and waywardness, Questions could rightly be raised about our legitimacy. In this sense, all discipline is evidence of His love. More than that, suffering in the Christian life is the training ground of the soul. The Father is equipping His children through adversity. If our earthly fathers discipline us for our good, how much more will the Heavenly Father who knows His children through and through? Thus, when we were united to Christ, a transaction and transition of monumental proportions took place. It would be a tragedy if we did not catch a glimpse of the grandeur of what this means. It is nothing less than union and communion with the Son of God in our flesh. John Owen was deeply impressed by the sheer magnitude of God's grace. He marveled at the way in which all of the blessings the Father grants actually come to us only but fully through our union and communion with Christ. For this reason, it is not surprising that Owen paid so much attention to what it means to be found in Christ and through him enjoy communion with God. Having reflected on this central dimension of Owen's thinking, we must now explore how he understands what it means to enjoy communion in and with the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Communion with the Holy Spirit It is unnecessary to say that he is the Prince of Divines. To master his works is to be a profound theologian. Owen is said to be prolix, but it would be truer to say that he is condensed. His style is heavy because he gives notes of what he might have said and passes on without fully developing the great thoughts of his capacious mind. He requires hard study, and none of us ought to grudge it. Charles Haddon Spurgeon A century ago, B.B. Warfield described John Calvin as the theologian of the Holy Spirit. It was as wise an insight as it was unexpected. For among his many contributions to the Christian Church, Calvin systematically demonstrated that the Spirit is the one through whom all the blessings of God, planned by the Father and purchased by the Son, become ours. The reason Warfield had few predecessors who saw Calvin this way was in part because Calvin neither wrote a separate treatise on the Holy Spirit nor treated his person and work as a distinct focus in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Thus, the task of focused and extended exposition of the Spirit's ministry awaited another. Into this doctrinal gap in the literature of the Church, John Owen willingly stepped. He consciously and rightly saw his Discourse on the Holy Spirit as one of his major contributions to the history of theology. In his introductory comments to his exposition, he wrote, I know not any who ever went before me in this design of representing the whole economy of the Holy Spirit with all his adjuncts, operations, and effects. The Forgotten Person Fifty years ago, in the context of what came to be called the Charismatic Movement, the Holy Spirit was frequently described as the Forgotten Person of the Godhead. Sometimes the statement reflected more on its authors than it did on the story of the Church. One could hardly be really familiar with the lives and writings of the Reformers, the Puritans, and the great figures of the First and Second Great Awakenings while accusing them of forgetting the Spirit. In fact, what was usually meant was not that the Spirit himself had been forgotten or ignored, but that the particular gifts of tongues, working of miracles, and prophecy, all of which were present in the New Testament Church, had been forgotten. But even this was not a true or fair assessment. For the Church Fathers, Reformers, and mainstream figures of the Great Awakenings were convinced from Scripture that, as elsewhere in redemptive history, these unusual gifts were given as confirmatory signs of new revelation. Unlike the Spirit's powerful work of regeneration, on which they had much to say, these gifts, they believed, were never intended to be permanent features of the Church's life. 
One aspect of the shift of emphasis that appeared in evangelicalism in the 1960s was the separation in many contexts of the gifts of the Spirit from the person of the Spirit, and more generally the gifts of Christ from the knowledge of Christ. Hand in hand with this, as the moral downfall of not a few made clear, was the confusion of gifts with graces, mistaking the exercise of unusual powers for walking in the Spirit. What was particularly striking in the teaching, preaching, and writing on spiritual gifts was the way in which the biblical narrative of the Spirit's ministry was ignored, especially his relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Against this background, John Owen's grand-scale exposition of the person and work of the Spirit breathes a different air. Axiomatic for Owen is that if we are to experience the power of the Spirit in our lives and the wonder of the new creation, we must first become familiar with His ministry in the life of the Savior Himself. Our communion with the Spirit is dependent on and shaped by His communion with Christ and Christ's with Him. For, as we shall see Owen stress, the Spirit who comes upon believers is one and the same Spirit who dwelt on the Lord Jesus. He received the Spirit to engage in His ministry as Redeemer. He has now given this very same Spirit to all who are united to Him by faith. So, our first step toward appreciating what it means to enjoy the communion of the Holy Spirit is to trace His presence in the ministry of Jesus. Christ and the Spirit Owen frequently refers to the words of Psalm 45.7 as descriptive of Jesus' communion with the Spirit. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. These words, applied to Christ in Hebrews 1.9, find their fulfillment in the way in which he received the Spirit without measure. John 3.34 Jesus, who gives us the Spirit, is the one upon whom the Spirit came. He received, bore, and was born by the Spirit throughout His life and ministry, not only prior to our receiving Him, but also with a specific view to our receiving Him as the Spirit of Christ. Thus, the Spirit who was present in and through the life of Jesus is the very same Spirit who is now given to all believers. There are not two Holy Spirits. The one through whom the Savior was conceived in the womb of the Virgin is the one who conceives us spiritually when we are born of the Spirit, John 3, 3, 6, and 8. This is none other than the one who empowered the Savior throughout His ministry from womb to cross, from tomb to throne. Christ received the Spirit, was filled with the Spirit, and walked in the Spirit in order that on His ascension He might give the Spirit who dwelt on Him to all who believe in Him, Acts 2.33. Only the Spirit of Christ has the capacity to transform us to be like Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18. For Owen, then, there are several stages in our Lord's relationship to the Holy Spirit in connection with His ministry to Him as the Messiah. In fact, Owen walks his readers through ten specific works of the Spirit on Jesus. These can be summarized in four ways. 1. The Incarnation of Christ The conception of Jesus has all the characteristic marks of the Spirit's work. As the Spirit overshadowed the darkness in the first work of creation, so also He overshadowed the darkness of the womb of the Virgin Mary. In the conception of the Savior, grace and nature were joined together in perfect and holy harmony. 2. The Ministry of Christ For Owen, it was axiomatic that although our Lord lived in the power of the Spirit, He acted grace as a man. Everything He accomplished for us He did as the divine Son of God, but did so as a man, fully man, truly man. He shared every aspect of our human condition, apart from sin, and He did so resting in the presence, communion, and power of the Holy Spirit. This is seen in two ways. A. In his human nature, Jesus grew not from sin to holiness as such, but in holiness, from holiness to holiness. He was not a freak or a superboy. The Spirit enabled him to make progress step by step with his natural maturing. This is implied by Luke when he says that Jesus grew in wisdom as well as stature and in favor with God as well as with man. Luke 2.52 There was nothing non-human a human or superhuman about the obedience of Jesus. His understanding, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, developed in harmony with his mental capacities. 
In the representation, then, of things anew to the human nature of Christ, the wisdom and knowledge of his human nature was objectively increased, and in new trials and temptations he experimentally learned the new exercise of grace. And this was the constant work of the Holy Spirit on the human nature of Christ. The Messiah did not come immediately from heaven to the cross. Rather, Jesus grew. The fruit of the Spirit in his life went hand in glove with a natural development of all his individual human characteristics. But this natural development was the fruit of his submission to the work of the Spirit. Therein lay the intimacy and the beauty of his experience of the love of his Father through his communion with the Spirit. He dwelt in him in fullness, for he received not him by measure. And continually, upon all occasions, he gave out of his unsearchable treasures grace for exercise in all duties and instances of it. From hence was he habitually holy, and from hence did he exercise holiness entirely and universally in all things. b. At his baptism, according to Owen, Jesus entered into the fullness of the Spirit, not for progress in holiness, but for the fulfillment of his messianic ministry. Gifts were given to him by the Spirit to equip him for the climactic stages of the ages-old conflict between the kingdom of God and the powers of darkness. Sustained by God's word, the sword of the Spirit, he simultaneously obeyed his Father, worked miracles, maintained his integrity, and caused Satan to flee. 3. The Cross of Christ Owen understood Hebrews 9, 13, and 14 as referring to the Spirit's sustaining of the Lord Jesus in His sacrificial death. It was through the eternal Spirit that our Lord offered Himself without blemish to God. Only through His communion with the Holy Spirit could Jesus bear the weight of the sins of the world and make atonement for them. A. The Spirit supported Jesus in His decision to offer Himself to the Father throughout the whole course of His life with a view to His sacrificial death. B. He sustained Jesus as he came near to the gate of the temple when, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he caught sight at close range of the bloody altar that awaited him. C. He undergirded Jesus in the breaking of his heart and the engulfing of his soul as he experienced the dereliction of Calvary. D. Owen adds a further moving touch to help us grasp the wonder of the communion of the Son with the Spirit. If, on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ committed his Spirit into the hands of his Father, to what did he commit his body? Externally, Owen says, it was guarded by the holy angels, mounting watch over the garden tomb. But internally, the Spirit preserved it from physical corruption in the darkness of the tomb, just as he had preserved it from moral corruption in the darkness of the virgin's womb. From womb to tomb, the Son was always in communion with the Spirit. 4. The Exaltation the Father exalted His Son by His resurrection and ascension. Yet the New Testament also teaches that the Son has power to lay down His life and to take it up again. Father and Son are together harmoniously active in the exaltation of the resurrection. But Owen also notes the role of the Holy Spirit in the resurrection exaltation. Romans 1.4 The Spirit declared Him to be Son of God with power through the resurrection. The Spirit vindicates Him in the resurrection. This is a work of transformation, and its end result is his glorification. As Owen puts it, he who first made his nature holy, now made it glorious. Not only then from womb to tomb, then, but from womb to glory, the Spirit was the companion of the Savior. What is the significance of this? It is that the Spirit cannot rightly be known, and therefore communion with him cannot be fully enjoyed apart from Christ, just as Christ cannot be known apart from the Spirit. For the identity in which we have communion with the Spirit is defined for us by His intimate relationship to the incarnate Savior. He is the Spirit of Christ. He is intimately knowledgeable about Christ. He takes what is Christ's and gives it to us with the goal of transforming us into Christ's likeness. John 16, 13-15 Christ Gives His Spirit in the upper room, Jesus had promised the apostles that he would ask the Father for the privilege of sending the Spirit to the church, John 14, 6. In the sending of the Spirit, both Father and Son are active, John 14, 16, 26, and 15, 26. Indeed, all three persons are engaged, since the Spirit who is sent also comes. 
In this sense, the Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son, and this business of sending the Holy Ghost by Christ, Owen says, argues his personal procession also from him, the Son. This, of course, is the Augustinian doctrine of the double procession of the Spirit. It is the clue to the nature of the eternal relationship within the being of God between the Spirit and the Son. Granted, there is great mystery here. It is also true for Owen that the fact that the Father and Son together sent the Spirit is an indication of the Spirit's relation to them both in the inner life of God as well as in His external activity toward the world. Thus, within the life of God the Trinity, the Spirit proceeds from both Father and Son to one another, just as He is the bond of union between the Father and Son and believers, so He is the bond of union between the Father and Son. John 17, 20-23 The Spirit is given to us in light of Christ's costly obedience. We receive Him freely as a gift in which we rejoice. In Owenian terms, we eye Him, ask for Him, receive Him, and admire Him. We eye Him in the sense of setting mind and heart on what Scripture teaches us about Him and seeking by faith to grasp all He is to us. Receiving the Spirit But what does it mean to receive the Spirit of Christ? As we do so in faith, the Spirit comes to indwell us personally. This lies at the heart of the new covenant promise. But what is it about this covenant that is so new? Here are Owen's words. Our union with Christ consists in this, the same Spirit dwelling in Him and us. We therefore partake of the very same juice and fatness with the root and tree, being nourished thereby. Thus, the very life that is in the tree is also in the branches. This mind-stretching and life-transforming truth is grasped only when the Spirit comes to open our eyes to the truth of God's Word. We should never separate our need of the Spirit from our possession of the Word, or vice versa. The first would be the error of the rationalist, and the second of the mystic. The Spirit comes to open the eyes of our understanding to the revelation God has given us, not to give each individual new revelation. Rather, He comes to lead us into the embrace of the truth already revealed. To be led by the Spirit, therefore, in biblical terms, involves embracing and obeying the revelation God has given to all, not following private revelation given to individuals. The immediate fruit of the Spirit's coming to us is the bond of our union with Christ. From this union flows all our communion with Him. As He comes to indwell us, He enlivens us, leads us, supports and strengthens us, and produces in us Christ-like character and qualities. He both restrains us from sin and sanctifies us more and more. Communion with the Holy Spirit In his farewell discourses, Jesus said that it was to the advantage of his disciples that he was leaving them, John 16, 7. In his place, the Spirit would come. He comes to us shaped, as it were, by Christ's communion with him. He is another helper, that is, in addition to, in place of, and of the same character as Jesus himself. He ministers to us as the vicar of Christ. His presence in our lives is the great relic that the Lord Jesus has left to the church. Virtually everything in the Christian life flows from and depends on this. What, then, is the nature of the Spirit's ministry? There are, according to Owen, four ways in which the Spirit evidences His presence and power in communion with a believer, indwelling, unction, earnest, and seal. Since for all practical purposes Owen regards the Spirit's presence as both unction and earnest as aspects of His indwelling, we can reduce this to two his indwelling, and his sealing. The Spirit indwells every believer mysteriously, but he does so, Owen emphasizes, personally, as the Spirit of Christ. Owen makes a distinction, which he shares with other Puritan writers of this theme, between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of holiness and his self-manifestation as comforter. The former is a constant ministry, The Spirit is always, under all circumstances, at all times, making us holy. He uses every situation, joys, trials, successes, and failures, to conform us to the image of God's Son. But the manifestations of the Spirit as comforter, Owen argues, are intermittent. He does not always bring us a conscious sense of the comforts of the gospel. 
This is an important point for the simple reason that Owen believes we need to distinguish between the indwelling of the Spirit, a constant, and the manner in which he manifests that identity in and to the consciousness of the individual believer, a variable. One expression of this is seen in the variations among believers in their experience of assurance. They not only differ from each other, but they may differ from themselves from one week to another. Nevertheless, Owen holds that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit brings with it several distinct blessings. 1. The Spirit comes to give the believer direction and guidance. This guidance is always moral and extrinsic in the sense that the Spirit gives it to us objectively in the word He has inspired, but it is intrinsic in the sense that it is also internal and efficient. The Holy Spirit illumines our understanding of the Scriptures and enables us to embrace their truth. This is tantamount to what the Apostle John means when he speaks of believers receiving the anointing of the Spirit, 1 John 2, 20 and 27, and therefore not needing anyone to teach them. Clearly, in another sense, John believes Christians need to be taught, he himself is in the act of teaching them by his letter. Rather, what he has in view is that the Spirit has revealed Christ to them. 2. The Spirit also comes to give support. He helps us in our infirmities. Romans 8.26. 3. Equally significant, the Spirit comes to exercise an ongoing internal restraint on our lives, to prevent us running headlong into sin. More than that, He injects into our obedience a spirit of joy and gladness that banishes our native sluggishness. Peter is his paradigm here. Peter was broken loose and running downhill apace, denying and forswearing his master. Christ puts a restraint upon his spirit by a look towards him. This in turn becomes for Owen a paradigm of the work of the Holy Spirit, who inwardly drops an awe upon our spirits that causes this holy restraint in order that we may not fall into sin. Distinguishing the Spirit from the Serpent Against this background, Owen raises an important question. How do we distinguish the promptings of the Spirit of grace in His guiding and governing of our lives from the delusions of the Spirit of the world and of our own sinful heart? This is a hugely important question if we are to be calm and confident that the Spirit with whom we are communing really is the Holy Spirit. Owen suggests four ways in which the Spirit and the serpent are to be distinguished. 1. The leading of the Spirit, he says, is regular, that is, according to the regulum, the rule of Scripture. The Spirit does not work in us to give us a new rule of life, but to help us understand and apply the rule contained in Scripture. Thus, the fundamental question to ask about any guidance will be, is this course of action consistent with the Word of God? 2. The commands of the Spirit are not grievous. They are in harmony with the Word, and the Word is in harmony with the believer as new creation. The Christian believer, consciously submitted to the Word, will find pleasure in obeying that Word, even if the Lord's way for us is marked by struggle, pain, and sorrow. Christ's yoke fits well. His burden never crushes the Spirit. Matthew 11, 28-30 3. The motions of the Spirit are orderly. Just as God's covenant is ordered in all things and secure, 2 Samuel 23, 5, so the promised gift of that covenant, the indwelling Spirit, is orderly in the way in which He deals with us. Restlessness is not a mark of communion with the Spirit, but of the activity of the evil one. Perhaps Owen had particular members of his congregations in mind when he wrote, We see some poor souls to be in such bondage as to be hurried up and down in the matter of duties at the pleasure of Satan. They must run from one to another, and commonly neglect that which they should do. When they are at prayer, then they should be at the work of their calling, and when they are at their calling, they are tempted for not laying all aside and running to prayer. Believers know that this is not from the Spirit of God, which makes everything beautiful in its season. 4. The motions or promptings of the Spirit, Owen says, always tend to glorify God according to His Word. He brings Jesus' teaching into our memories. He glorifies the Savior. He pours into our hearts a profound sense of the love of God for us. How then does the Spirit act on the believer? The Spirit comes to us as an earnest, a pledge, a down payment on final redemption. He is, here and now, the foretaste of future glory, but His presence is also an indication of the incompleteness of our present spiritual experience. 
Owen here writes in sharp contrast to those who spoke of release from the influence of indwelling sin and struggle through the liberty of the Spirit. Precisely because he is the first fruits and not yet the final harvest, there is a sense in which the indwelling of the Spirit is the cause of the believer's groaning. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Romans 8.23. The presence of the Spirit brings us already a foretaste of future glory, but also simultaneously creates within us a sense of the incompleteness of our present spiritual experience. This for Owen is how communion with the Spirit, understood biblically, brings joy into the life of the believer and yet a deep sense that the fullness of joy is not yet. Sealed with the Spirit The Spirit who comes to indwell also comes as a seal. Owen was intensely interested in what Scripture means when it speaks about believers being sealed by the Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13, 4, 30, 2 Corinthians 1, 22. As late as 1667 he wrote, I am not very clear on the certain particular intendment of this metaphor. At that time he reasoned that it is promises, not persons, that are in view in this sealing. He concluded that we are sealed when we enjoy a fresh sense of the love of God within us and a comfortable persuasion of acceptance with God. The promises of God, the promises of grace in salvation, are sealed to us and we, correspondingly, enter into the enjoyment of Him. However, in his work on the Holy Spirit as Comforter, Owen wrote more definitively, The sealing of the Spirit is no special act, but only an especial effect of His communication unto us. The effects of this sealing are gracious operations of the Holy Spirit in and upon believers, but the sealing itself is the communication of the Spirit unto them. Perhaps conscious of the discussions that had taken place among members of the Puritan Brotherhood, including his own friends, Owen goes on to note, It hath been generally conceived that this sealing of the Spirit is that which gives assurance unto believers, and so indeed it doth, although the way whereby it doth hath not been rightly apprehended, and therefore none has been able to declare the especial nature of that act of the Spirit whereby He seals us when such assurance should ensue. But it is indeed not any act of the Spirit in us that is the ground of our assurance, but the communication of the Spirit to us. It is the Spirit Himself who is the seal. This brings Owen back to our starting point. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one whom the Father sealed. John 6.27 he communicated the Spirit to him. What was true of Christ then becomes true for those who are in Christ now. As the Spirit ministers as that seal, assurance of grace and salvation follow. Thus the testimony of the Spirit that we are God's children is the effect of the presence of the seal of the Spirit, which activates the believer's sense of assurance. Owen provides a vivid word picture of this. The Christian, he says, by the power of his own conscience, is brought before the law of God. There the plea of the Christian's conscience is that he is a child of God. He produceth all his evidences, everything whereby faith gives him an interest in God. There are reasons why he believes himself to be a true Christian, but, says Owen, Satan in the meantime opposeth with all his might, sin and law assist him, many flaws are found in his evidences, the truth of them all is questioned, and the soul hangs in suspense as to the issue. In the midst of the plea and contest the Comforter comes, and by a word of promise or otherwise overpowers the heart with a comfortable persuasion, and bears down all objections, that his plea is good and that he is a child of God. When our spirits are pleading their right and title, he comes in and bears witness on our side. When the Lord Jesus at one word stilled the raging of the sea and wind, all that were with him knew that there was divine power at hand. Matthew 8, 25-27 And when the Holy Ghost by one word stills the tumults and the storms that are raised in the soul, giving it an immediate calm and security, the soul knows his divine power and rejoices in his presence. In a word, Owen is saying that the Spirit does in us as seal what Christ did for the disciples as Savior. The reappearance of Matthew 8, 25-27 here is surely significant. This, as we have seen, was Owen's life verse, the text that, on that never-to-be-forgotten day in Aldermanbury Chapel, 
had brought him into the full light of assurance and joy in Christ. What we have here, in all probability, is a transcript of Owen's own experience and the reason why communion with the Spirit was so significant to him. Christ did not leave the apostles as orphans, John 14, 18, nor does he leave us bereft of comforts. We receive blessings beyond our expectations. We are given the Spirit in order to live in prayerful communion with him as he leads us into the enjoyment of all the blessings of our inheritance. And, Owen says by way of summary, these are, he is bringing the promises of Christ to remembrance, glorifying him in our hearts, shedding abroad the love of God in us, witnessing with us as to our spiritual estate and condition, sealing us to the day of redemption, being the earnest of our inheritance, anointing us with privileges as to their consolation, confirming our adoption, and being present with us in our supplications. Here is the wisdom of faith, to find out and meet with the Comforter in all these things, not to lose their sweetness by lying in the dark as to their author, nor coming short of the returns which are required of us. Such communion with the Spirit brings us consolation in afflictions, a peace that flows from the assurance that we are accepted before God, a joy that is ours as we share the anointing of the One who received the oil of gladness without limit, and a hope which brings stability and direction to our lives. But what of the returns on our part of which Owen has spoken? What does all this mean for us in terms of our response to the privileges of communion with God? Our Returns Three negative and three positive responses may be mentioned here. Before listing these, however, it is worthwhile to stand back and reflect on the structure of Owen's thinking. For the substance of what he writes makes such demands on his readers that it is easy to be so caught up in following it that we miss seeing its underlying structures. But the very fact that he thinks of the Christian's response returns in both negative and positive terms is important. The Spirit brings us into union with the crucified and resurrected Savior, and therefore into communion with Him in His death and resurrection. Since this is, as it were, the ground on which the Spirit operates, it also becomes the pattern of the Christian life, death and resurrection, mortification and vivification, putting off the old and putting on the new. Gospel negatives and gospel positives thus become the leitmotif, the melody line for all of our fellowship with the Son. This was the apostolic pattern. This, then, is why Owen gives us these three negative and three positive exhortations. Do not grieve the Spirit. The metaphor, associated with Paul's words in Ephesians 4.30, is actually drawn from Isaiah's exposition of Israel's post-Exodus wilderness wanderings. They rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit, Isaiah 63.10. The Christian has entered into a deeper and more intimate relationship with the Spirit and must learn to be sensitive to His love, kindness, and tenderness. Even if the Spirit cannot be passively grieved, we can live in a way that is grievous to Him. He will respond to us as though He had been grieved since we have become insensitive to the offensiveness to Him of our spiritual indifference and carelessness. The result is that we lose both the power and pleasure of our obedience. Owen heaps on our consciences motives for not grieving him and indicates what positively the believer is to do. Let the soul, in the whole course of its obedience, exercise itself by faith to thoughts hereof, and lay due weight upon it. The Holy Ghost, in his infinite love and kindness towards me, hath condescended to be my comforter. He doth it willingly, freely, powerfully. What have I received from him? In the multitude of my perplexities, how hath he refreshed my soul? Can I live one day without his consolations? And shall I be regardless of him in that wherein he is concerned? Shall I grieve him by negligence, sin, and folly? Shall not his love constrain me to walk before him to all well-pleasing? Do not quench the Spirit. If the metaphor of grieving reflects on our relationship with the Spirit, quenching reflects on his ministry. The word picture that comes to Owen's mind is that of wet wood cast into the fire, a spirit and lifestyle that in effect hinder the gracious work of the Spirit as, like a fire, he burns in love for us and seeks to stir up a love for holiness within us. 
Rather than dampen inner promptings to faithfulness and obedience, we must learn to fan them into flame. Do not resist his word. Owen emphasizes the relationship between the Spirit and the Word, in this context from the ministry of Stephen. His opponents could not withstand the wisdom and the Spirit with which he was speaking, Acts 6.10. They always resist the Holy Spirit, Acts 7.51, by resisting the prophetic Word of God. Here again, Owen is concerned about our spiritual vision and what we eye when we listen to the exposition of the Word. Fail to eye the ministry of the Spirit as he gives gifts to the church for her upbuilding, that is to say, see only mere men, no better and perhaps no more able than ourselves, and we inevitably reduce the preaching of God's word to the words of men. It is then that we are in danger of belittling the word, then resisting it, and ultimately despising it. Our calling then is to fix our gaze where it properly belongs. The word is the Spirit's sword— its exposition is the Spirit's instrument to release the Word into our lives to do its work of conversion and transformation. But, as we do so, Owen urges us to remember that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Divine Being, the One who proceeds from the Father and the Son, the Eternal Spirit. He is therefore to be worshipped, loved, and adored. It is the ever-increasing Christ-likeness to which this leads that is both the fruit of our communion with the Spirit and the goal in His communion with us. Owen well understood that the Holy Spirit does not bring glory to Himself, but to the Son, but this should not be used as an argument for our failing to give glory to the Spirit as well as to the Son and the Father. The role of the Spirit within the Trinitarian economy does not minimize His full deity, nor does it exempt us from worshiping Him. Rather, the Spirit's role calls forth from our hearts admiration, adoration, praise, and devotion to the one who so lovingly shines on the sun and comes to us as the Spirit of grace. Because this is his ministry, we have all the more reason to worship the Spirit together with the Father and the Son. Here, if anywhere, the comment, albeit intended in another sense altogether, is actually true. The Holy Spirit has been the forgotten person of the Godhead. Perhaps, then, as we hear it across the centuries, John Owen's voice will help awaken us to the ways in which we may have grieved, quenched, and resisted the Holy Spirit. Conclusion Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost For luminous exposition and powerful defense of scriptural doctrine, for determined enforcement of practical obligation, for skillful anatomy of the self-deceitfulness of the heart, and for a detailed and wise treatment of the diversified exercises of the Christian's heart, he, John Owen, stands probably unrivaled. Charles Bridges Our chief end, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Glorifying God means worshipping Him as God, for the divine nature is the reason and cause of all worship. Consequently, it is impossible to worship any one person and not worship the whole trinity. This principle brings Owen full circle in his theology. In God's activity within his three personal being, all three persons are always involved and engaged, opera trinitatis ad intra sunt indivisa. So too his activity in relation to the created order is always the work of all three persons, opera trinitatis ad extra sunt indivisa even when one person exercises a particular function, appropriations. Owen is at one here with the fathers of the church, who developed the doctrine known as perichoresis, or circumincesio, that in everything God the Trinity is and does, each of the three persons relates to and engages with each of the other persons. The choreography of the divine being is beautifully one in its diversity and diverse in its unity. Both internally and externally, the persons of the Trinity always function in the harmony of a single deity. We therefore never worship any person as though his personhood could be in any way abstracted or separated from his participation in the single essence of his deity. This, of course, is the mystery of the Trinity into which the human mind can never fully penetrate. Yet this is not only because our minds are fallen and therefore both darkened and twisted, for before the Thrice Holy One, 
Even seraphim, who have never sinned, veil their faces and cover their feet. Here, members of the family of God in both its heavenly and earthly branches can only gaze from the shoreline on the crystal sea on which is reflected the eternal majesty and glory of the triune God, lost in wonder, love, and praise. It is into this life of fellowship with God that we were baptized, into the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, it is at the Lord's Supper that we taste and enjoy this life in its simplest expression. For here we are invited by Christ Himself to taste and see that He is good, and to feed on Him. As we do so, the Spirit engages in the work He loves, the work of taking what belongs to Christ and making it known to us. As Horatius Bonner, who stood in the Owenian tradition two centuries removed, would express it, Here, O my Lord, I see Thee face to face. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. Here grasp with firmer faith the eternal grace, and with all my weariness upon Thee lean. And as through the Spirit we enjoy fellowship with the Son, we remember that God the Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 We are drawn into the love of God and anticipate the day when the marriage supper He has prepared for His Son will take place. Just as we have been baptized into the name of the Trinity, we enjoy fellowship with each person in His distinctive expressions of grace toward us. As we do so, the frequently sung words of the doxology, now better understood, give expression to our affections. For we have been loved by the Father, reconciled through the Son, and are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit. Thus we sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, might we say in response, Amen and Amen. About the Author Dr. Sinclair B. Ferguson is Professor of Systematic Theology at Redeemer Theological Seminary in Dallas and Dean of the Doctor of Ministry Program at the Ligonier Academy of Biblical and Theological Studies. He previously served as Senior Minister of the historic First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina, and also serves as a teaching fellow for Ligonier Ministries. A graduate of the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, he serves on the Council of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and is a trustee of the Banner of Truth Trust. Dr. Ferguson is author of more than two dozen books, including In Christ Alone, Living the Gospel-Centered Life, The Holy Spirit, Grow in Grace, and Let's Study Philippians. His writing interests have ranged from scholarly works to books for children. He has served as minister of two congregations in Scotland, one on Unst, the most northerly inhabited island in the United Kingdom, and the other in the center of Glasgow, the largest city in Scotland. Dr. Ferguson and his wife Dorothy have three sons and a daughter. Thank you for listening to this recording of The Trinitarian Devotion of John Owen by Sinclair B. Ferguson. This book was read by Bob Sauer. Please visit ChristianAudio.com facebook.com slash Christian Audio, or twitter.com slash Christian Audio to offer your impressions of this work and to explore additional titles.